back in our lives. Future Cannabis Project FCP02. Thanks everybody in chat for joining us and everybody on the replay who's going to rewatch this one, myself included. That's kind of weird saying thank you to yourself, but mm -hmm. hey, I just did. So we're rolling with it. It's Friday night and we're back with Sun Grown Mids talking some genomics uh, and cannabis plant breeding. Thank you for joining us again, Trevor. I appreciate that. Of course, Jed. Thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate the invite. Yeah, no problem. My pleasure. I wish, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. We're having a great conversation beforehand. This is going to be an excellent, you know, addition to where we were going. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. You always have some great conversations before the cameras start, don't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we're, um, so tonight we're going to be talking about a few things that from the breeder perspective, the cannabis breeder perspective are going to be important. These are usually traits or characteristics such as like yields or secondary metabolites, uh, things that are important to a person looking to breed the next best cannabis uh, cultivar. And so this one is definitely going to have, you know, a very close application to what a lot of people are doing. And it was funny uh, that we were talking earlier beforehand about like cannabis breeding books. And, you know, I've got a few of them and I've read them and they're great. There's a lot of information in there, but there tends to be not a complete knowledge set. And it's not for, you know, lack of effort or anything. It was just kind of the information that we had at the time of when you're doing these things almost anecdotally uh just kind of based off perception you get a certain rule set and a lot of this rule set uh, like i said is it's kind of like cannabis breeding this is how you breed cannabis but then there's also the whole plant breeding world and i love that you help bridge the gap between the two because it's really picking up where that cannabis knowledge has kind of left off and this information is actually what's going to get us a lot further down the road so thank you once again for coming back and and dropping some of this knowledge on us man of course yeah no thank you and i think yeah that's that's a good lead-in the um i feel like to a certain extent some of this stuff there's been a hesitancy in the cannabis publishing world to dive into this level of uh, information just because when you start getting into quantitative inheritance and heritability and these sorts of things, if you actually read all the literature, it it's incredibly complicated math and uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> very hard to understand. We're going to break down some of it and go into some of the different statistics and stuff. And I tried to keep it as light as I could. I'm certainly no statistician myself, so uh, <laughs> thank yeah, you. <laughs> tried to keep it, yeah, light on the math, but, but like that's uh, it's something that Tony said uh, a couple weeks ago. I think it was during the seed collectors uh, discussion in chat. He mentioned um, that the uh, the breeding is math, and that's mm -hmm. really. That's when you get down to it, you're dealing with frequencies and statistics and a lot of variants that you're trying to figure out without necessarily knowing exactly what you're doing. And we came up with these mathematical systems or theories for approximating what was going on. And I hope tonight we get to kind of go through the theoretical mathematics, but then bridge that gap to some of the genomics and how this stuff's being applied today and like really kind of the difference that, you know, we talked about the calculator and the mm -hmm. pen and paper sort of technique. We're going to do that heavy on the first half. And then on the back half, we're going to talk about how, you know, you send it to a lab and the lab tells you whether or not something's there or those sorts of marker based analysis and it's good to know their methods it's good to you know almost be able to you know you don't have the same equipment so you can't necessarily double check their work per se but you can tell if what they're giving you is kind of making sense at least by having a foundation 
and and one of the things one of the things I kind of actually had written down from the last time we talked. Uh, speaking of math, um, I love math. Music is math as well. Uh, music has been my life. So yes, um, but I had a question here. It's like, how close to an algorithm for awesome weed are we <laughs> with all that we know already, just by doing the math? Like, is there a algorithm for typing the fruity awesomeness? <laughs> are we getting there? <laughs> um. We're getting closer. Like, there's definitely, um, I wasn't able to pull it up just this evening, but you can see kind of the older maps, the, like, we talked about linkage maps before, and linkage maps are kind of, if you were to have an algorithm, you'd need a linkage map to know, like, this genes on this chromosome here, et cetera, et cetera, and, like, build out the whole linkage map. And they've done this with, like, fruit flies and... Mm -hmm mice and model organisms they've mapped the entire genome of these things not just through sequencing but through traditional linkage map assemblies wow. and yeah and like it took decades of work to do this but they did it and essentially you can see the early rudimentary steps that were happening about 20 years ago in the linkage maps and it was very sparse and then you can see what's going on now and even some of the stuff now is pretty sparse but it's getting more and more you know they're filling out the chromosomes and finding where the different genes are and what their associations are so that a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about in terms of quantitative inheritance and traits have been figured out through more advanced genomics and that's really it's going to save decades um in terms of the actual time and labor to figure this stuff out okay and, and that kind of makes me wonder because you know science does rapidly advance and sometimes we're you know we're we're building models off of something this big and all of a sudden we understand the thing that's this big and it changes our perspective. Does that come into play at all with plant genomics or do we pretty much have a good idea of what the actual building blocks are? Yes and no. Um, so epigen epigenomics are still very much understudied and poorly understood in pretty much everything, but in cannabis in particular. Um, that's an area that a lot of people will point to, but really the, the bigger issues and what's coming online now are, um, trend, uh, the transcriptome. So you've got the genome and then you've got the transcriptome. So the transcriptome <laughs> is what essentially translates the genes into the different proteins that they end up becoming. Okay. So this okay. is like RNA and stuff like this. And I understand so, that. Yeah. And like when we get into like uh, terpene synthase genes, mm -hmm. they will have a particular process that they do, but they share that same metabolic pathway and process with cannabinoids. And so there's a lot of crossover here. And on top of that, these same gene families are shared by almost every species. So all the other plants that have terpenes have these this sub or these families of genes called terpene synthase genes. And so we we're going to be able to go through and look at some of those, how they interact with each other, and then how also they interact with cannabinoids because of the complex it's one of those things where we we understand that the transcriptome will make the cells do particular things and so it'll be like hey you're going to do cbd or you're going to do thc and both of those rely on the precursor cbg so like every one of these is kind of like a, a molecular chain or link in a chain so to speak okay. and um so the transcriptomes like complicates things. Then there's uh, metabolics, basically, based, looking at all the ways that plants uh, metabolize things. Um, 
there's proteomics, like there's a whole num a whole mm -hmm. list of omics that are on <laughs> top of genomics that okay. are complicating the picture of things. And we'll get to that at the very end. In particular, there's a paper that I just read that um, it talks about cannabinoid inherent inheritance and uh, it's it's wild. Like it's so much more complicated than just genes or dominant recessive. It's uh, mitochondrial DNA, uh, chloroplast DNA, all sorts of stuff going on. That that's nature being nature, saying you might get close, but you're not gonna figure us out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I, one thing you did mention, especially with the terpene synthase or terpene synthase, and we did have a question on that. Um, on my Instagram and we get to that later, you'll probably actually cover it by the looks of things. Um, but the big thing there I heard is, you know, other plants do create terpenes. It's a universal almost location mode of action to create these. So we don't have to wait for cannabis to be widely studied to fully understand this. Like we can actually already get there just by using other plants at least, or, get closer to an understanding because again there's always probably going to be some variable that mm -hmm. might be different in there yeah no totally that's something that um if you read the papers a lot of times when they're looking at and doing like early research into quantitative traits they'll rely on the same trait structure or the same trait in a different plant and so for terpene synthase genes, they were able to identify and locate a lot of them because of their similarity and their shared structure with these other terpene synthase genes that are going on in other plants. Um, there's also a paper that's about uh, um, the genetic mechanisms controlling flowering time. And same thing, where there's a set of genes that are associated with those traits and they already, you know, completely mapped them out and know what they are in cotton, um, maize, rice, a whole bunch of other crops. And so they've been able to find the same set of subfamily of genes in cannabis, and it's helping them to elucidate the flowering time mechanisms. Wow. And that's huge too. And that has a big um, commercial application. So that's something that I imagine is going to be looked into a lot further uh, with R&D dollars from a lot of these big companies. Uh, the, the faster they can bring in a harvest, the, the better they're doing. So that is, you know, follow the money. That's of interest. So <laughs> I'm yeah. sure that'll pop up at some point. Totally. And that's... Uh... It's really interesting, um, and this is something that uh, Kamara, um, he brought it up, and there, if you look at the early research into cannabis, so much of it is determined by the research agendas of the different agencies mm -hmm. or entities that are funding the research. And all of them in the United States had to have DEA approval. You've got the University of Mississippi and all the research that they did. And um, pretty much most uh, chemotype information, the early studies establishing standardized protocols for doing uh, GC and all the different chromatography, as well as a lot of the early genomic studies, were really oriented towards an forensics end goal. So it was all about okay. fingerprinting strains, varieties, and identifying and disrupting drug net uh, trafficking networks. Like that was, that was the whole rationale for the, the research for probably the first 30, 40 years from like the wow. 70s. 69 is when University of Mississippi started operating. Okay. So from like 69 to the present. And they and they they grow some pretty bad cannabis down there in Mississippi. But to to your point to uh, to the fingerprinting, the kind of the practical application of that was, you know, let's say Joe Bob is just growing. You know, he's the original. This is completely fictitious story. People get sensitive sometimes. But let's let's just say Joe Bob in the hills of you know Minnesota is even wilder. Um, came up with the original sour D. If the, if he has the original cut, it has the original profile to it 
Now, if he were to be busted and they were to fingerprint his his cannabis, well, when somebody gets busted with 20 pounds down in California and it has this exact same fingerprint, that that was kind of the practical application of why they were interested. So they, they did a little bit of our work for us, but it was for kind of jerky reasons, essentially. <clears throat> totally. Totally. And because that research had already been done, a lot of that was some of the early commercial applications that you were seeing. Like, uh, Steep Hill was like yep. strain fingerprinting sort of thing, where you could bring your your strain or your variety in, they do the testing and then say, okay, it's got this chemical profile, which is its fingerprint sort of thing, um, which wasn't particularly successful. Um, mostly because like, you know, they were dealing with much different populations and sets of variables. So yeah, uh, comparing like geographical land races that had diverged over many, many years and creating your data sets off of these and saying like, cause this is what Carlton Tucker did. The, uh, he was the drug czar under Reagan. Um, hmm. he yeah, he, he, doing research into him, the, it's incredible how successful and dumb people can be sometimes. And <laughs> like, the things he said were just mind boggling. Um, he claimed that uh, smoking marijuana increased your propensity for homosexuality. And that's kind of been characterized for why he lost his job. <laughs> okay, um, yeah. Yeah. I, I totally remember quotes like that and people like that. Another one that comes to my mind, uh, it, was, it was after Washington and Colorado went, but Utah was sinking a medical, and there was a sheriff. They were doing this bust out in the woods, and they were talking about these stoned rabbits. And these rabbits had lost fear of humans because they were still trying to come around and eat the leaves while they were destroying it. And it was going to be an ecological disaster. And yet... Dude, it's still it's like searchable and findable on the uh, YouTube on YouTube's. But yeah, it's how can it's like how can you say these things with a straight face? Don't you have like? Didn't you go to college, man? But yeah, yeah. 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 No, so I get your point. But Re Reagan really was when the drug war kicked in uh, for a lot of people. So this person was highly effective at their job. Oh, fully, and like he saw himself as like. He was an evangelist for the drug war. And yeah, so it's interesting going through that history, um, you know, because he was like, he was one of the people who advocated spraying paraquat on cannabis in Mexico and like argued that the health effects, the known health effects of paraquat consumption were less harmful than the like scaremongering he was doing about the wow. health effects for cannabis. So he's a wild, wild figure. And there's a whole host of other folks um, that continue. There's like New Haven, Connecticut has a whole research department dedicated to it. There's, it's a very interesting story, the history of academic research in cannabis. And I feel like it was a really shitty story until about like the last 10 years. And in the last 10 years, it's been really, it's not just people who were doing it because they had government jobs and were being paid to essentially like perform a task, which was usually in furtherance of prohibition. Um, it's people who actually care about the plant and are interested in doing the research and developing it for our sort of uses. And, and growing it proper too. Um, you know, again, you mentioned uh, Mississippi uh, University there and, and, and what they're growing isn't even like street level cannabis, you know, consumer level cannabis. It's, you know, you can't, it's like comparing apples and oranges almost from what I've seen there. And, and how I've originally understood it too, is, you know, a lot of these studies were done by NIDA, the National Institute of Drug mm -hmm. Agency mm -hmm. or something to that effect. Yeah. Yeah. But NIDA was really only interesting in funding things that were looking for a negative 
Uh, They weren't going after any positives. They didn't want to hear the positives. So uh, a lot of the research, kind of like you're saying, is skewed into the genomics um, kind of breeder level, probably not undertaken in a serious like cultivation manner, more as you said, in a law enforcement manner. Mm-hmm. Um, I find it, I find it completely fascinating. Well, all this stuff's fascinating. Um, but you mentioned that, you know, like flower time, flowering time was located and that's kind of universal. Terpene synthase is, is kind of universal and we're able to study those in other plants. And I'm not into, you know, the GMO aspect of things, although I know we're going to see it and I know it's going to create better cannabis, but there, there's things, you know, like we put salmon genes into fruits to, to preserve color. Um, but one thing I always say about like cannabis and the benefit of studying it like this is we might find something, even if you're completely against cannabis, we might learn something through studying cannabis that is going to affect you and you can go derive your pill form of that. And that's fine. And a good example is the endocannabinoid system we didn't know about this a long time ago and we really kind of found it through cannabis research but it seems to control a lot of things in the body so even if somebody is anti-cannabis i still think they need to support the study of it and that's i don't know a a long way of of kind of agreeing with you but you know we never know what we're gonna find and we need to we need to dive deeper so I, I appreciate you indulging me on that little rant there, but that's, uh, let's see here. Uh, GMO will improve cannabis. How do I think GMO will improve cannabis? I see that one pop up and, and I'll just touch that real quick. Um, the IPM, um, being able to grow it in certain areas. There's, there's a lot of things you can do to a plant and I just, I'm not rooting for it but uh, I see where it makes sense for certain applications. And I'm probably just digging myself a hole here, but <laughs> I, I saw that pop up in chat and I just wanted to address it because I put it out there. Yes, you know, I, we probably will see it. And yes, it probably will make some awesome stuff, um, but I'm gonna go for sun growth mids packs and uh, continue to grow that stuff. <laughs> Cause I know you know your business. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, no, I, um, I'm not like, yeah, I've been very anti GMO. I've been very anti CRISPR. Um, I think those things are inevitably going to happen. Um, the money, it has to. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but it's, 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 you know, again, I hate to be that, that devil's advocate, but it is going to be an industry. It is going to be business and it is going to be about money doesn't mean it has to be for us and that doesn't mean it has to be for everybody we have a good community i think we're going to be fine i think we're going to be better because of it but to deny that something like that's coming mm. sorry yeah. sorry to interrupt you there yeah. no, <laughs> i get I, emotional I, I fully agree that it's going to happen um and there are going to be people who will argue and debate over whether or not it's a good like specific application right. um and then there's just going to be people who are like flat out no um immediately no <laughs> uh, so uh, no. And i i understand exactly i i get i fully understand that i think that there's a lot of cautionary tales there there's a lot of reasons for hesitancy and skepticism mm-hmm. Um, it's a market strategy that will be deployed by people who are operating in the cannabis space yeah. in a way that gives zero fucks about what we care. <laughs> and yeah. so, um, yeah. you know, it's going to happen. Uh, I think that it remains to be seen whether or not, like, just because I remain skeptical just because of the roundup ready sort of like scenario where like by and large i mean okay i grew up as a kid in like the 90s and the alternative alternative globalization or anti-globalization movement like the wto and like had all these posters from there of like that rally 
that were anti-GMO, like that was one of the main talking points that was going on in that time period. Mm. And we were told how it was going to revolutionize things and it was going to make these great results. We haven't really seen that. We've seen Roundup Ready crops adopted and that's, you know, increased pesticide applications, but it that hasn't really done all that much in terms of overall yield improvement. It's certainly not like Butang and like traditional breeding or Bulang, sorry, um, with his, uh, with the breeding of the dwarf um, wheat varieties that then that basically created the green revolution. Like those definitely had some like negative consequences and side effects in terms of intensive agricultural sort of uh, processes being exported all over the world. It also had massive yield increases that have helped feed millions of people around the world. So like both of those two things are true um that isn't you know we haven't seen those similar trend lines with gmos relative to yields and trade inheritance gains okay. necessarily but the one area it has been applicable and we can get off the gmo topic um <laughs> when when i went to uc davis like they start the discussion when you talk about uh, resistance breeding at GMOs at this point, because in so oh, many wow. crops, there have been just, you know, massive, uh, like, complete wipeout of crops has mm -hmm. been either predicted or imminent from different uh, pathogens. And then they've done some sort of like papaya is an example, bananas are an example, yeah. oranges are an example. So like, these are instances where essentially to address catastrophic crop failure, they introduced GMO crops supposedly to like address that issue specifically. And there just wasn't another solution. And so they would, the dude literally posed the question and like, these guys were true believers on GMO. They were <laughs> like, you know, like talking evangelically about how like, well, this is going to get people to buy into the shit. Um, so no, that, that level. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but they, the thing was, was like, do you want your morning to start with orange juice or not? Was like essentially how they felt GMO technology was going to be normalized because wow. Americans want bananas. They want orange juice. They want these mm -hmm. like staple foods. And if crop failure or GMO is kind of the dichotomy they're presented with, they'll choose that. But we're not at a point where we bottleneck the dermplasm so much. And we haven't even really even scratched the surface or begun to investigate this specific area of resistance traits. Like there's, there's a little bit, but not much. Um, yeah, like we're not there yet. And so we like having these discussions with them and we're like, yeah, but what do you do before you get there? Right. It'll, it'll be interesting to see if they come back to kind of revisit that issue, just kind of like banana collapse. That was one that I was kind of a little familiar with, but instead of just, you know, band -aid, band aiding it with this, with a uh, GMO fix, uh, if you could actually go back and breed for it and, you know, it, it's a long route again, it, it's almost kind mm -hmm. of like uh, a cannabis breeder stabilizing a line versus making an F1 and putting it on Instagram. So, yeah, yeah, it, exactly. That's, I think, um, you know, somebody mentioned hearing, uh, professors, uh, talking about the same approach and in the same way. And I think like a lot of it has to do with like it's in fashion it's high tech it's it's something that's cutting edge in the field that makes you relevant whereas like going back and just like hunkering down and trying to improve resistance through traditional breeding methods is like it's not only labor and time consuming it's just not like it's not sexy 
Yeah, yeah, and I I didn't fully appreciate that fact until I was uh, in the in the um, in my school program with WSU. They were it's at, it's at market now, but the Cosmic Crisp Cosmic Crisp apples. We were finishing up field trials for that and talking with one of the professors, uh, Gary Molden, uh, you know, we had all these seeds and I'm like, so, you know, you, I try to approach him like cannabis. I'm like, yo, you ever like plant seeds? And like, what do you get? Look for like different phenotypes. And he just looked at me like, that's not how we do it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I understand now, but yeah, I understand yeah. why to kind of, to your point, uh, it takes a long time. <laughs> it takes a cool. long time to do that. Yeah. That project was really impressive, and that's something that is a really good model. Now, granted, apple breeding is a whole different beast than cannabis breeding, um, but that was like a farmer-driven sort of operation where it was a... I've read a, uh, a little bit about it being like a participatory breeding program where the farmers and the... Uh, the professors work together to develop an agronomically superior apple, and supposedly it's Cronus but I, I haven't had it. It's 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 good. Uh, it's in the market. I think it was exclusive to like Washington for a year, uh, but also the back end of that entire experiment, how they licensed the apple and they controlled the distribution, is a study in itself. Uh, mm -hmm. so that's, that's fascinating. Uh, and again, that can relate back to cannabis in a way if you, if, if you want it to, but that's off, off of our beaten path for this evening. So yeah, Cosmos Crisp though. Cool. So yeah. yeah, I know we got, um, I know I'll keep my eye on chat. So chat, if you guys have some questions, definitely get them in uh, and I'll try to get some up towards the end of the presentation here. But hey, if, if you caught our first round, you know that we've got some awesome information and I just want to thank uh, Trevor ahead of time again for putting time into building these presentations. Um, I'm sure you guys all know and can appreciate it, uh, but you know, making making these things do take time. You got to compile, and I, I assume you're like me. It's like accuracy is important to the point to where you beat yourself up to make sure like every line and every sentence is as accurate as you can possibly verify. Uh, so, I, I do appreciate the time you've put into them, and I'm looking forward to, to what we've got for this evening as well. Yeah, this one's um, a lot more copy and paste. So hopefully, hopefully my professors and all my sources are uh, are on their game. Um, hey, you got to hang out with a good crowd. Yeah, don't don't. Uh, yeah, you got to know who to copy paste. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, I will uh, click into the presentation. Um, and like I said, feel free to interrupt me. Um, and if you know, chat. I can't really see you when I'm doing this, but like, yeah. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. I got you. And, and I guess one, one question before, while you are launching this, um, that kind of came up is a lot of these, so a lot of these models that we're looking at, how, how true does it hold to like the poly hybrid and then like the inbred line? Are the rules or the is the math kind of the same or is there an assumption with this that we're starting with a, a true breeding or an inbred line? Um, I'll try to uh, where that's relevant. I'll try to okay. talk about that. Um, awesome. I actually left out the um, the little subsection on um, covariance and really see Wright's ideas about the inbreeding um, coefficient, mostly because um, it's theoretically it's incredible. It's a very awesome idea. It's not necessarily like it's a theoretical abstraction. It's not necessarily um, a an accurate depiction of a population um so there's that and the other reason um i left it out is just because we cover a lot of fucking math um <laughs> but uh beyond that i will say yes there's a difference it pre 
creates a totally different dynamic than if you have an inbred population. Uh, I think, yeah, I'm not, uh, to the extent that, like I said, if I, if it comes up in the discussion, I will, uh, I'll get into it specifically, but I will say that the main thing with an inbred, and this is something that I forgot to mention last time, is that a, the reason for inbreeding in Allard, it was in the slide where I talked about some of the ideas that Robert Allard talks about, and he talks about prepotency, and prepotency is when you increase homozygosity at a particular allele for whatever trait. So essentially when you're inbreeding, what you're doing is you're increasing the rate of homozygosity by 50% every generation. So, okay. so half of you're either going to get half of them to be a homozygous, quote unquote, dominant or a homozygous, quote unquote, recessive. And then 50% of the population will still be, um, excuse me, it's 25, 25, 50. That's how it breaks down. So it's a one, two, one breakdown. Each time you self and you do this, you're going to increase the overall inbreeding coefficient by 50%. So it goes from 50% in the first generation when you have a hybrid to then being a 75% in the next generation, 80 something in the next, 90 something in the next, so on and so forth. That's the basic principle on the inbreeding coefficient. Once you reach homozygosity, mm -hmm. what you've done is you've reduced the amount of variation that you're going to transmit from one generation to the next. Because at that particular allele, the plant can only pass on one possible, uh, 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 yeah, one possible allele or zygote. So does that answer the, yep. the inbreeding question? Yes, yeah, that does. And and just the reason why I asked and brought that up um, is just, again, for, for some more of just like practical application. I know a lot of people today when they're, you know, putting two of their favorite cultivars together, um, they might not be starting with something that's been inbred to the point to where it's getting multiple pure lines out of it. Um, there's still still kind of the variety. So I always like to, to ask where that fits into the relationship. And, you know, I appreciate, like you said, you'll, you'll kind of mention it when it applies. But uh, yeah, I'm always always trying to get that, find that practical application aspect. Yeah. And like, I mean, we have a really interesting, um, so the population's been skewed intensely because we bred it for particular traits over time so it's out of equilibrium but it's also incredibly heterozygous because it's such a poly it's one and outcrossing species so it starts with a high level of heterozygosity but then when we just poly hybridize things for 30 40 years all we're doing is increasing that heterozygosity within the population by adding something into the mix instead of breeding down. And the few okay. people that have kind of done that, that work, breeding down, DJ Short gets mentioned, um, David Watson or Skunk Van Sam, um, different people who have done, uh, other folks more recently, like uh, Tony, um, Tony Greens, he's done a lot of back cross work, going pretty deep. But, um, most people are just doing a combination of different assorted breeding and it's all based off of phenotypic selection and what's the new the new thing that gets introduced every year or five right right okay awesome thank you for that um so yeah and again i can't really see things i don't know if you guys can see things is the the Let's see. We don't have the presentation yet. No. So if you go to, let's see, if you go to share screen, I believe. Oh, right. right. And then while we're doing that, I'm just going to put up a super fun flyer for tonight. Boom. 
It's like we're hanging out with Charlie Sheen. What's up, Charlie? How you doing? I love your uh, breakdown. Very public, very epic. Uh, winning, still using that word. I'm sure the kids know what that one means. I mean, what, what was she doing with a shrimp fork in her purse anyways? I don't know. Something about tiger's blood and Adonis DNA in there. But uh, let's see here. Okay, so you've got your presentation there. If you go full screen, I will add it to the stream here and get rid of our awesome flyer for the night. And then there we go. We got you up, and I will make that a full screen. Cool. So you're good to go, sir. Thank you. Yes, and I have also a second. Um, so I can see on that. Cool. So quick review. This is what we went over last time. We talked about Mendel, Simple Inheritance. We talked about Wilhelm Johansson, Pure Line Theory, Genotypes, Phenotypes. He's also the person who came up with the idea of the genotype environment interaction. We talked about quantitative traits and the individuals who confirmed that, that should say confirm, not conform. Uh, confirmed that Mendelian inheritance, um, quantitative traits conform to Mendelian inheritance. Um, Nilsson L did it looking at wheat, um, the color in wheat, and uh, EM East looked at the length of tobacco flowers. Um, then we looked at heterosis and transgressive segregation. We talked about chromosome theory and linkage maps. Um, then population genetics and the different uh, theoretical mathematics that really kind of are going to be the focus of a lot of what we talk about today. Um, then we talked about plant reproduction and different breeding methods. So that was last time you missed it. You can go back and watch it. There's also, um, you can hit me up for a folder. Uh, I have the presentation and all the different uh, source material that I used last time. This is a, a slide from last time's uh, presentation. It talks about qualitative versus quantitative traits. And this kind of demonstrates the difference between simple inheritance that Mendel, Mendel looked at on the left side over here versus what we're going to be looking at over here, quantitative traits. So quantitative traits are controlled by the interaction of multiple genes, each with a small effect on the overall trait expression. The quantitative trait exhibits continuous variation within a population. So if you look at height in people or um, terpene uh, content in cannabis or cannabinoid content in cannabis, those are all they show continuous variation throughout the population. Um, this is associated with the idea of additive and non-additive variants. So additive variants, instead of thinking about things in terms of dominant recessive, even though there can be a dominance effect at the allelic level, when you're dealing with quantitative traits, you have a whole bunch of genes and each one of those genes can be either homozygous or heterozygous for whatever particular allele. Each of those is inherited individually and all of them combine to then to create the expression of the trait. And all of those genes then have interactions that with their environment. So each one of those interactions creates the possibility of added variants. <clears throat> they also create the possibility for additional genetic uh, variants. This can be through the dominance effect or through just an additional allele for a trait. Or in cannabis, there's this thing called uh, copy number variants. There are a lot of copy number variants for uh, cannabinoid synthase in cannabis. So the genes that control the expression of particular cannabinoids, partic cannabinoids particularly THC, are have a lot of different copy number variants, which means there's just duplications of these genes. 
So that's additive variant. Non-additive variant within a population is this idea of epistasis. And epistasis is the idea that different alleles, even though they may be the same, can have an effect just through their interaction with each other. Um, it's, it's a complicated subset of uh, quantitative inheritance. So yeah, I'm playing around here with the screen. So I'm sorry, by chance, sorry to interrupt you by chance. Do you have headphones or anything that you can plug in there? I'm, I'm starting to get a little bit of a, a feedback. It's not your cell phone. The cell phone's muted, but I think yeah. I'm just hearing a little um, echo back. Here, let me go just a minute. Yeah, um, no, sorry to, sorry to interrupt you there. No but, worries. Uh, yeah, weird. let me go find a, um, a set of headphones. Cool. Yeah, no problem. Well, uh, oh gosh, that's horrible. Um, okay, there we go. As you can see, I, uh, I'm moving. I'm moving my room around, guys. I'm getting some new tents. I'm getting some new gear. So I have one of those grower problems of uh, where do I put things now? And I'm playing that shift around the room, but nobody cares. I'm sorry, guys. I just went off on that. <sighs> This is fun. I've had the pleasure of looking over what we're going to be going through tonight, and I've taken my own notes. So definitely a lot of note taking is going to be going on. Um, I did see some questions in here. Elka, I saw you throw one up there. Thanks for joining us. Um, and we're going to get to that one a little bit later. Uh, also, there was right below it. Oh, gosh, a question about fem, fem seeds. Where did we go? Okay, there's your bottlenecking. Uh, Gary Garden, is it possible for a fem seed grown plant to throw out bananas in flour if excessive nitrogen is fed? I will say absolutely yes. Uh, feeding can be a stressor, and that is something that can just push a plant over the edge. So as far as stress, yes, we definitely can. And Jeff, my man, thank you for caring. I see that there. I appreciate you. Uh, all right, Sungrown Mids is coming back to save me because... I could talk about some of this stuff, but uh, no, we've got we've got Trevor here to do that tonight. So let's see here. Almost coming back. There we go. I'll, I'll put this up. I feel less self-conscious there. Getting back to the quantitative genetics. Uh, my lady is not down with another tent. Oh, I'm sorry, Jeremy. Yep, I hear you. I'm a uh, you know, it's one of those things, as long as it stays in here, then it's not her problem. But uh, when everything starts spilling in the hallway, it will be. Okay, and we've got, uh, we've got you back with us here. So, cool. I will throw up the uh, presentation. Uh, can you hear me all right? Is everything sounding good to you? I can. Can you mute my uh, computer? Let's see, I just tried to, yep, okay, you're muted now. So I muted the computer, um, and you're going for that. So let's see, to not get a big feedback loop, I'm going to do that. And let's see here, Heather Wright says, what's in your tent um, right now? I am finishing up. I've got uh, one of the Westport's grape juices in there. Uh, I've got a couple freak shows in there. Got Burmese Kush, which is the first time running it. Strawberry banana smoothie, first time running it. And a uh, diesel glue, first time running that one as well. So that is what's in the tent right now. I'm getting excited. Those are about to come down. Um, Burmese Kush made the cut i cloned that one it's looking great and it looks like it has some potential so that one got cloned um westport grape juice obviously that's we're we're running that one hard um so that's can sticking up too but the other ones uh, i have more seeds i'm just kind of burning through seeds right now to find something that i might want to work with later but um all right we've got you back do you want me to or you got your phone unmuted there okay so yeah you should be good to go now well, let's see here. Not hearing you yet. Hmm, it looks like it's unmuted from that end. Let's see. 
This is the Future Cannabis Project. We do it live. <laughs> Every time. Uh, let's see here. I can't, uh, can't hear you over the phone one, even though it looks like the icon's unmuted, which is kind of interesting. I see the computer's muted. That one should be picking it up. T. Barrington asking, is he on Bluetooth? Um... I don't know. Yes, Ian, you are just in time for the tech difficulties. I remember a conversation a long time ago when I first started doing some of these shows. I remember a comment. Somebody just typed in chat. It's like, I don't tune in for the information. I just tune in to watch you guys go. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? And we've gotten a lot better since then. Uh, that's just in general. We've got uh, we've got the savior himself. Just give me a second. Oh. <laughs> hey Peter. Um how about if I just kill the uh the phone? Yeah. Yep. yep. What are you guys what? trying to do? Oh, um, he, we were just having a very small feedback issue. It wasn't it wasn't having two microphones on. It was just I felt like I was getting a little feedback from from his microphone. So, we we're just trying to work around that. Yeah. Yeah, but I think I just killed the mic on the other one, and so we're good? Yep, yeah, you, you, we're good now. We're good. Okay. I think, yeah, okay, yeah. so I'm okay. in screen share, I think. Um, yep, you're back in screen, okay. you're in full mood. Okay, I put you up. We've got the full presentation on the screen now. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I can't see anything. If anything comes up, Chad, interrupt me, feel free. Uh, yep. Peter? Yeah, all that good stuff. So, um, quantitative genetics is the analysis of traits whose variation is determined by both the number of genes and environmental factors. This is uh, very important. So, like I was just saying, each one of those individual genes that controls the trait has an interaction with its environment. So, that makes it so that there's much more overall environmental influence on. Uh, quantitative traits as opposed to qualitative traits, which are typically determined by a present absence sort of uh, breakdown or dichotomy. So, selection. Basic goal is to develop elite genotypes with an outcross population, that'd be cannabis, typically speaking. This is done by increasing the frequency of a favorable alleles, which is selecting on additive this is oftentimes represented by an A in a lot of the different sort of mathematic representations that they do, because a lot of times they'll talk about A plus like vari additive variance plus interaction would be like additive A plus D, and like there are equations for determining or estimating those effects. Um, in a large population, continual improvement or response to selection is expected over a number of generations. With inbred populations, now this also can apply to cannabis, but this doesn't apply to most of what we're talking about in terms of cannabis. Very few inbred populations exist in the types of cannabis that people are breeding with. So if you were to, however, start with an inbreeding population, you would be looking to generate inbred lines to cross these to develop elite lines for breeding purposes. Um, this is what was done for like heterosis or corn breeding. Here you're selecting on the genotypic values and this is more of the additive and the interaction. So you, you've already established that there's an inbred genotype your, there's very little variation within the population. So when you're making your cross, you're looking at both the interactions and the additive variance that you're bringing to it. So epistasis is more important when dealing with inbred lines. Um, further progress depends upon generating new variation through additional crosses. So this is why in a lot of traditional breeding, they've already inbred their lines or in traditional crops, I mean to say. 
they've already bred a lot of their lines to inbred lines, and now they're just looking for new variations that they can add or introduce into their population to increase some sort of agronomic or economically valuable trait. We're not really typically at that stage in cannabis. Um, so outcross populations. Improvement in an outcross population is, this is, you know, uh, this is why animal breeding is a good uh, source of information. Um, Neville was a big proponent of looking at pedigree charts and looking at the different methods that uh, animal breeders have used. Chimera has brought up uh, the point that with cannabis, we're dealing with an obligate outcrossing species. And so when you're dealing with that type of breeding structure, it's much more akin to what's going on for animals. Um, and we talked about a little bit about this last week. So recurrent selection is typically the method that's been used. And in cannabis, we've used recurrent selection for traits like shortened flowering time, increased yield, and um, uh, THC particularly, uh, but also CBD. Other breeding programs have been more oriented towards CBD or limiting THC, but by and large in the quote unquote drug market or drug cannabis, we've been breeding for high THC and we'll look at some of those numbers later. So within generation change, the increase in trait mean among the selected individuals. So this has to do with, with the uh, breeder's equation. We'll get into the specifics and there's some good charts and diagrams that kind of break this down. But essentially the selected individuals are the portion of the population that you're choosing to breed with and have reproduce. They're going to ideally have a higher mean than the general population as a whole for whatever the trait is. So if we're constantly selecting for a subset of the population that are high THC individuals and their mean is in the upper percentile up in the, you know, it was the tens, the teens, the twenties, the thirties. That process was a process of continually selecting up in that upper gradient and threshold and not selecting just in the overall population and uh, within generation change refers to that mean difference. Um, this is, well, this can be translated into generational change. And I just kind of explained that in terms of the gains that have been demonstrated over the decades in THC numbers. Um, individuals are chosen on the basis of their phenotypic value. So mass selection, this is largely what we've done. Um, performance of their offspring. So this is progeny testing. If you go and you read Neville's work on, or read Neville's post about his work on, um, well, I've posted almost all of them in my stories, but I'd encourage people to go on to uh, uh, the Mr. Nice forum and read all of Neville's old posts. He goes in depth about progeny testing and how you can use pedigree charts and things like this as a way of really um, doing your selection and improving your traits. Um, another way of evaluating this is uh, SIBs or family-based selection. So you can grow out a population and grow out multiple different half SIBs or related plants and see the variance within them and through that, you can do regressions and kind of approximate. This is a, a lower salience way of determining the heritability and trait performance in a population, but it is an, a way that is used. Um, and the idea is to use information to obtain estimates for the breeding values of individuals. So this is just explained the uh, uh, the breeder's equation and we'll get into that. So here's the basic model. You've got your phenotypic value and a lot of the equations it's represented as Z. And 
So phenotype equals genotypic value plus the environment. So a genotype interacts with its environment for a or a quantitative trait, there's far much more of this interaction going on because there are more of these genes controlling these phenotypes. This is why in terms of uh, traits, when doing analysis for and estimating heritability for quantitative traits, you really have to try and control for the amount of alternate variability. So there's variability from the environment. That variability, by and large, the vast majority of it, aside from some poorly understood epigenetic portions, is not inherited. This is what's inherited. And you have to discern this portion of the equation to be able to select and breed and improve your uh, your breeder's equation for the particular traits that you're selecting for. So this slide gives us a good demonstration of this idea. You've got variance in your phenotype, which is the, re the result of variance in your environment and variance in your genotype plus the variance in the genotype environment interactions, which is explained down here, which is variance in genotype environment is a genotype by environment interaction reflecting the fact that genotypes may respond in different ways to changes in environment. So this is why it's important to grow out your varieties in multiple different environments. There's a paper later on that we'll look at, um, and we've talked a little bit about by Anne Michelle uh, foe. And she talks about growing out uh, monocious cannabis in different environments and scoring the, um, the male flower trait expression from, I think, like a one to six. And the point being is that in the different trials that she ran, the expression was different. And that difference was very much a result of this genotype environment interaction that was going on. Um, the goals of quantitative genetics are to partition the total trait variation into the genetic portion. So this is the heritable portion versus environmental components. Environmental components, largely speaking, are not heritable. Um, Part of it's about predicting resemblance between relatives. We're not going to address a lot of that. That's more of the inbreeding covariance. Um, Seawall Wright's work is really where you want to look if you're interested in this. This will give you your inbreeding coefficient and theoretical odds of um, particular breeding programs. Um, the other Goals are to find the underlying loci contributing to genetic variation or quantitative trait loci. This is really where we're at now and where a lot of the science is. We'll be looking at a bunch of different papers that have looked at different uh, quantitative trait loci for flowering time, for um, uh, sex determination, and different secondary metabolites. Um, deduce the molecular basis for genetic trait variation. That's where a lot of the genetic marker work is going on right now. And then figure out the expression loci. So this right here is a lot of this stuff is looking at the transcriptome and things like that right now. And the different ways that the transcriptome can modulate these traits. Um, this is really just a representation. The main point of this slide is to show here's how three genes distribute in a continuous variation. Here's how four genes can distribute into continuous variation. And this is how it would plot. 
here we have a bell curve. This bell curve, I think it's typically called the Gaussian distribution. Um, each one of these bars represents a standard deviation from the mean. So here's your mean of the population. And each one of these out in each direction represents a standard, one single standard deviation from the mean. This is also known as a single Haldane. Um, we talked about JBS Haldane last week. Um, this was one of his ideas, or he helped develop the math for it, so he gets the, the naming credit. So that's a introduction to quantitative traits. Um, we've gone over yeah, the basic intro there. Now, the breeder's equation, um, and Chad, feel free to chime in uh, or, you know, there's any. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm here still. Cool. Yep, we're just listening. And, and one thing, you know, too, on the last one, on the last slide, um, you were you're talking about Loki, and Loki is basically, this is within the DNA it's in the genome it's it's is do, do the alleles sit in the low key or how does that I'm just trying to so to paint pictures for people um, yes. when we're talking about this loci what where is that in the plant or in the DNA type what are we looking at there so these two A's would be there so to speak and then this would be another loci right here the two B's so okay each loci has two alleles and that's um so yeah the, the loci have multiple alleles and um and the alleles these represents and, the different loci that would then be inherited independently okay and the alleles are going to be the things that are controlling different traits such as whether you're going to be purple or whether you're going to be cbd dominant or whether you're going to be that's kind of where that happens is the allele mm -hmm. level yes okay so the alleles which are turning on or turning off certain traits granted that's a, 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 a glossing over of <laughs> everything um but those are sitting on the loci and the loci are what we're looking at here. And then the numbers across the bottom are the distribution. You said the top one has three different traits or three gene pairs and the bottom has four. Uh, yeah. Is the number along the bottom just the combinations? Yeah. Or what is so that this, represent? Yeah, this is the phenotypic distribution that you get as a result of this genetic pairing. So this right here corresponds to um, Nielsen L's work with wheat uh, color distribution. So when he crossed wheat, he found that three genes were controlling the expression of the color of the kernels of the, the grain. Mm -hmm. And this was the phenotypic distribution that he saw in the population. And so when you see a phenotype break down like this you're dealing with continuous variation throughout the population that's controlled by three genes in this instance when you've got four genes controlling an individual trait then you would see a distribution more like this in your population and again it's continuous but you're dealing with more genes and a larger subset to get a full representation of the accurate distribution Okay. And, and that's good too. It expands on, you know, last time I, I kind of learned a little bit more about phenotype. Uh, it's more than just genotype expressions. It's really as on the last slide, you said it's genotype plus the environment and the environment doesn't necessarily add things or subtract things, but it turns up or turns down that genotype, uh, expression to get the to get the phenotypical expression and then you just added another layer onto that with environmental interactions uh you know how does it handle okay all of a sudden it fell to 30 degrees well what is that genotype going to do with that environmental input and express as a phenotype if mm -hmm. i'm hopefully learning as we go along here 
Yeah, no, totally. And like the difference between what will happen for some sort of like Siberian autoflower or Alaskan autoflower or something that's been acclimatized to a cold environment and has adapted to it to compared to what will happen to something that's just been in the tropics for those environments, you know, like that sort of genotype environment and action is going to be drastic, drastically different between those two different genotypes put into yep. those two different environments. And then if you take either one of them out of their, you know, their adapted environment, you're going to see a, a wide range of interactions that are not just genetic interactions or genetic expressions, but are instead the way that those genes express in the environment. Cool. Right on. All right. Thanks for thanks for clarifying that one for me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the breeder's equation. This is really, uh, you know, I I like to joke. Are you really a breeder if you don't know the breeder's equation? <laughs> don't ask that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's taboo. Um, but. Uh, so yeah, in the breeder's equation, this is the most simple representation of it. Um, it gets way more complicated and it, yeah, it's intense. But simply put, what we're dealing with is response equals heritability times selection. So this represents roughly what's going on here in the breeder's equation. So you've got your population mean that's represented by this U. I, like I said, I didn't take statistics. I don't know the math name for the U. Um, but <laughs> you've got your mean here in your bell curve population. Then you've got over here, this is the mean on your threshold for your selection. So this is the subset of the population that you're selecting for over here. You're not selecting all of this portion of the population. You're selecting five to 10% of the population. that are higher, or lower thresholds, depending on the trait. Then in addition to that, it helps to go, well, um, here, I'll, I'll go to this really, this is the better slide for showing the full thing. So in the last slide we had, here's your, in this case, random mating population. So here we've got a random mating population. It's not inbred. You've got a continuous distribution of your trait. This is your mean. Your selection threshold is here. In the next generation, what you're going to do is you're going to do the same analysis to try and analyze your phenotypic distribution in the population. And you're going to figure out the mean of this population. The amount at which it's increased for the trait that you're selecting is the response to selection. So, and that is an effect of heritability and the intensity of your selection. So your intensity of selection and the heritability of your trait will determine the rate of the gain that you get from one generation to the next in terms of mean population phenotype expression. Does that all make sense? Yeah, I'm, it's funny. You should see me right now. I'm holding up like fingers. I'm like, okay, so intent selection, meaning I've got a whole bunch out there and I'm going through there and picking it. And then the variability um, or heritability is the ones that I that I want. So I'm, I'm thinking those. Okay, so it, things will be better if I do a tight selection only for the things that I'm wanting because in the future offspring, it's more likely to pass on those traits that I've gone after. Is that rough? Yeah, a, a little, a little uh, caveat there is that the selection is the amount of the population that you're selecting. So you're saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to select this subset. I'm, all of these are going to be used in this breeding project. 
Okay. So the it's... heritability of the trait is the amount of response that you're getting under the intensity of selection. So we'll get in here's here. Okay. This is the idea of heritability and heritability is oftentimes a it's a sub like only a fraction of the phenotypic variability is heritable. And this is actually why phenotype and this whole method is incredibly labor intensive and requires way more work than the new methods, which involve a lot of screening for already identified genetic markers. But essentially what you're doing here is you're growing out huge populations that have and you're using a method of selection that isn't very good because you're using phenotype, the phenotypic expression of this subset of the population. You're essentially saying, okay, let's just arbitrarily say this line right here is the 30% THC. So I'm only selecting things over 30% THC. Everything else in the population is not getting selected for. Okay. And so, the yeah, you're being super selective. Level. Yeah, and so the increase that you have in the population in the next generation is the heritability of the trait. And the increase meaning more 30% or above THC in the next population? It wouldn't, because of regression, it wouldn't be by choosing these extreme phenotypes, we're not necessarily going to exceed the extreme threshold we've already established there will most likely be a regression to the mean and but as long as there's an increase relative to the mean to the previous generation you've experienced some gain okay so that makes sense like we might not get all 30 percent but if the previous generation the mean was 15 and now all of a sudden this new generation after the intense selection of only 30 percent if the new mean jumps to 17 percent well that's a two percent increase from the previous generation totally totally exactly that's okay. yeah awesome. and like if we were to say like this is 10 percent or like 30 percent thc and like maybe this is down 20 or something or the high teens this distribution here when you look at this like you're getting pretty close you're up in the high 20s for your mean in the next generation so you know, in theoretically just looking at this it would have been your response to selection would have been very good for the particular trait which means you have a highly heritable trait so the concept of heritability is really there are ways of estimating it. It's a little bit complicated, but it's the fraction of phenotypic variance due to additive genetic value. This is heritability is additive variance divided by phenotypic variance. That's narrow sense heritability. This is what we're dealing with typically with outcrossing species. Um, then, so phenotypes can be measured directly, breeding values can't. So this is kind of what we're talking about there. In theory, if we had the ability to select the one plant here with the absolute best breeding value and transmit its genetics into the next generation, we would significantly increase this mean every generation much more so than just using this method of selecting the mean amongst the best um so broad sense heritability this is what applies more to inbred uh, or inbreeding crops and um goes over narrow sense a second time but broad sense heritability applies when you're selecting among pure lines um here you're dealing with genotypic variance and divided by the variance in the phenotype you know your genotypic values much more in an inbred line so this is a known quantity much more so than it is over here where you're dealing with open pollination or random mating populations here's how you would actually 
this is how you calculate your um, heritability for a particular trait. You calculate the average phenotype of two parents, calculate the average phenotype of their offspring, then you graph these points across a set of parents and their offspring. So you're doing a regression analysis and looking for the correlation in between these. Um, this is zero heritability. If your plot ends up looking like this, the trait just simply is not heritable. Here, you've got a 0.5 heritability. Even though it's not great, um, we'll see, that's actually a pretty good heritability and very, very significant gains can be accomplished with a 0.5 heritability. Um, and then this is perfect heritability. It's a one-to-one -one and there is no real, um, the phenotype and the genotypes match up. And then the obvious correlation there that I see just, I mean, looking at the graphs, um, all the dots on the one with heritabil heritability, they're all right on the line. Um, whereas the one at the top was zero, you know, that's the most spread out of the graphs there. So can that almost be related back to like inbred line would be on the, the bottom chart because everything in that falls similar or close to each other. Whereas like the, the poly hybrid cookies would be the top chart because there's so many <laughs> possibilities uh as far as what comes out or does yeah. that is that a fair relation uh loose uh, relation it is uh it's a little bit different just because we're dealing with individual dynamics within those sort like that's a that's true of talking about the overall like the polymorphism or the heterozygosity in the population Heritability is a little bit different just because it's dealing with the transmission of the particular trait over a generation. And one of the things that's like, you know, you can have a trait that like transmits 100% from one generation to the next, but the heritability is zero because it's a fixed trait. It's an inbred line. Like you're okay. not you're not getting any gain you're not changing anything you're not it's just it is what it is it's stable. okay but okay. so it's it's one of those but it's totally hair like it's uh that's one of the paradoxes because this is a uh this is a regression analysis between generations as opposed to uh like uh, an analysis of a individual so to speak you know okay yeah population versus singular yeah yeah, yeah. okay and here actually uh is uh sorry earlier we had somebody uh let's see shredder 0911 was talking about statistics uh and being being able to assign numeric values to each trait that everybody agrees upon you know again kind of setting that standards um and it just kind of reference like stem rub, you know, his, his number may not match uh, what our numbers is, but yeah, you, you yeah. do have kind of a few, a few charts in here or something that at least looks to seek to establish some sort of framework for that. Yeah. We'll get into some of that later. There was a really interesting paper that um, was recently published. The name of the author escapes me, but um, they did, an analysis of morphological traits of in throughout vegetative growth and essentially created a predictive equation for and obviously a standardized method of evaluating these traits so that you could do this predictive method um but essentially this right here fuck i I know what it is. It's this paper, um, the characterization of key physiological traits of medicinal cannabis um, as a tool for precision breeding by name, feel, sorry if I butchered their name at all in 2021. So this paper is very interesting. They actually were able to determine the heritability of particular traits and 
obviously they had to do that by standard standardization. You can't just, you know, I would not end up with these same results if I didn't use the same standardized methods of evaluating the traits that they used. And so that's why it is very important for us to, one, establish what these standards are and two, normalize them across different research uh, modalities. And, you know, to the extent that we who aren't necessarily in like academia or doing these research uh, papers, can adopt or develop these methods, or we as a community can at least come to our own shared version of them. Uh, yeah, that would that would be very helpful. <laughs> fair, fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not sure if my stem rub uh, numbers are the same. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But uh, so this right here, this gives a demonstration of the heritability of particular traits, some of which are very important, like dry bud weight it is a hair, has a heritability of 0.33, which is actually a relatively high heritability. Um, this right here shows um, different thresholds, like in here, it's still... Uh, heritability is still high enough that you have a high probability of being able to select to accurately select for the trait that you're selecting for just the traditional methods and now is this like a a 0 0.2 chance out of 100 you're gonna get the same thing because um, that seems like that would seem like a really low number to me no 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 so that's yeah. not yeah that's not how this is represented no so what's going on here is that this right here is so you've got a 0.33 percent like the fractions here are one is the total so heritability of here is one so okay if this was one, you would have bud weight a hundred percent heritable, just fucking lunkers. Okay. Um. So having a heritability of thirty-three, that's a third heritable. Like that's a good fraction there. Um. That puts you in this range of heritability, which makes it so. You can do selection without needing, like, if you're down in this range for heritability, um, well, I should say this range, uh, this is the range where you're doing populations that are fucking enormous, and ideally, you're going to be using molecular genomics to identify the trait and screen the population for the trait so that you don't miss it, because you could there are definitely instances with very low frequency and very low heritability traits that if you're not doing you know if you're not increasing this accuracy threshold you're really really you're not going to get significant heritability and capture the trait in the next generation so your trait improvement's going to be shit unless you are able to improve your selection accuracy, which is done through the best way. I mean, there are ways of doing it. We're kind of going through ways of uh, improving selection accuracy later on. But um, it's the trump card in it's, I hate that phrase. Um, the <laughs> It's the thing that's changed the game is genomics because that really improves this portion of the graph your ability to accurately select is vastly increased once you have um molecular genomics to improve your accuracy otherwise like your accuracy in terms of selection is great if you're dealing with a highly heritable trait you know it's not that hard but your accuracy goes down significantly and not like, it's not a linear, but it's like a, they say here, it's like a, it's a, it's a square root uh, standard deviation. So wonky. Uh, it's not linear. Yeah. yeah. 
So this is heritability. Heritability for these rates have all been figured out using standardized statistical methods and methods for analyzing phenotypes um, and then tracking those over generations. Um, so selection in the um, in the breeding breeders equation is demonstrated here. So selection is this portion of the population that is allowed to reproduce. Selection differential is this difference, your mean population versus the mean of the subset that you allow to reproduce. It's a function of ver uh, phenotypic variance of the population and the selection intensity of the breeding program. So if you increase your selection threshold or reduce, excuse me, your selection threshold, you're gonna have a much different mean than if you have a much more selective threshold. Um, and then this shows how the whole equation works out. This could be any trait, it can have whatever value. Here you have your trait, it's your mean in the population. Here you have your selection intensity. So consider a population that varies for a given trait with a mean of X1. Suppose some with an extreme phenotype are selected for breeding and they have a mean of XB. The selection differential is computed as XB minus X1. So if X1 equals five, the population mean is five, let's just say 5% THC and xb equals eight then the selection differential is three so this is how you would compute this portion of the breeder's equation to know that you're selecting your the differential in the group that you're selecting is three greater than the mean and that is going to give you kind of um Gosh, I'm, I'm learning along here. That's going to give you how far you come with your, your X and B. The wider the number in between XB, which is the mean of your selection, versus X1, which is the mean of the overall. That's growth. what's going to come right here in this next generation. And the XB, okay. with the XB, what you've got is you just said in my population this is the best subset and this is its mean phenotypic value okay so i i only selected the best and this is its mean phenotypic value in the next generation you're going to select that are only selected from here so all of this rest of the population is no longer allowed to reproduce and continue going on okay. only this group can, uh, leads to this next generation and then subsequently your are you is is your goal to get that differential uh smaller and smaller as you go on through the generations i'm, I'm just trying to figure out what the where the significance of the differential would fit in other than it's, it's part of the breeder's equation but so you know, how, key, how do you track that? The key here is that this is just telling you how much better the mean phenotype is for the thing that you like. Here's my population, but I have only selected for this group. Now, the reason the main thing here is that it is assumed that this group is doing what it's doing and expressing its phenotype, its greater phenotypic expression for the trait because of additive variance. So this is a rough approximation for additive variance. That's really all it is. It's saying that this group over here expresses more or better for the trait of interest than the rest of the population. And it becomes a proxy for um, additive variance, essentially. Is that okay. Yes, I think I'm following it, but I know that on further review, it's going to make 
clearer and clearer sense to me. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So this is, it's really just a way of guesstimating the best breeding value. So we guess that this group has the breath, best breeding value in the population, but we don't know for sure. So we're going to like select a group. Then down here in the next generation, you're comparing the mean of the population to of the previous generation to the mean of the subsequent offspring generation that's been selected from these breeding pairs. So <clears throat> here, suppose the offspring from our breeding population has the following distribution with a mean of x2. The response to selection equals x2 minus x1. If x2 equals 6.5, then the response to selection is 1.5 because the mean was 5. So we've got a 1.5% gain in the overall population in the mean expression for the trait. So if we were starting with a population that in this generation had a mean of 5% THC, we then selected the subset of the population that had the highest expression for THC, which was 8%. We then, with a differential of three, we then looked at the offspring and compared it to the parent, gener mean, parent generation's mean, and we got 6.5, thus we were able to calculate the response to selection and the overall genetic gain from one generation for, to the next for our trait. Okay, I see the math there. I see where that adds up now. And because again, the mean from the first generation was five, which is represented by X1 in the top graphic. Yes, yes. Okay. Totally. So this is just a regression analysis. And because these right here, even though you're selecting, you know, up around 8% and only the 8 percenters and even higher, if 8% is the cutoff threshold, so it's 8 plus, then in that situation, because of the regression that happens and because we're just selecting based off of phenotype as opposed to the actual known breeding value and genotypic value of the plant there's a regression and we're seeing that regression here in 6.5 so from eight percent down to 6.5 even though this is where we were selecting and it was things that were only eight percent or greater we then have you know a response that's that's or a, a mean the next generation with 6.5 which is a regression back from where we selected from but an improvement upon where we were in the overall population so um yeah one goal of selection is to choose those parents in a sample with the most favorable breeding values. The problem is that we cannot completely predict the breeding value of an individual from its phenotype alone. So this is, we just were talking about this. Um, consider that heritability is the correlation of breeding value with phenotype. It relates how predictive the phenotype is to offspring value. Now, this is the type of equations you'll see um, we haven't covered what all of these represent. It's not very important for our purposes. But point is, is that phenotype alone is not a very good predictor for breeding value. It's all right, and we can get this type of improvement, but it would be much better to get, if we're selecting the 8 percenter, it would be great to get 8 percent in the next generation and not have that regression i.e. pick the best breeding value in the population. So the question posed here is, is there a better U than Z? Is there a better mean that we can use to look at than phenotype? So there's the mean of progeny. This is progeny testing. We just did that right here. This is progeny testing. So this right here is the mean of Z and it's helpful and useful information, 
and the progeny testing is better information, but it requires growing up an entire generation to be able to determine the breeding value of the cross you've made. And doing that it, like in a sizable enough population to get any statistically valid information from it. It sounds like the stuff like Breeder Steve is doing down in Uruguay or wherever. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And and last week we had a um uh pedigree chart from Robert Clark and uh David Watson talking about breeding uh skunk one. And it goes into it at least lays out the process that you would be doing here with this type of progeny testing. Um, you can also do weighted mean values of other relatives. We talked about this earlier. You could do like half sibs or siblings and grow out all the different populations and then weight the values that you get from those to determine or to help inform your calculations on um, on the overall means that you would use to calculate the uh, heritability of traits. Um, and then this one, mean values of relatives grown in a variety of environments. So this is also another key factor. Multiple environment trials help inform your overall heritability or your understanding of heritability, because if you're able to grow out just as a for instance, this is individual plants, not populations, mind you. But, you know, every hype clone has been grown out in a thousand different environments at this point. And there are lots and lots of different COAs that kind of represent a range of the potential expression of these different phenotypes in these different environments or genotypes in different environments and the phenotypic expression that is. Uh, demonstrated or exhibited by these different clone only. So you could take Cushman's and look at the range of var uh, variables that it has in different environments and determine the amount of environmental variables or influence that are impacting that particular variety that are then used in breeding. So this will help you reduce the overall noise in your evaluation or in your equations because you're controlling for some of that environmental variance. If you're able to say, okay, Cushman's produces between like 27 to like 35% THC or some shit I've seen. And granted, I understand there's all the issues with the test. Let's just pretend this is accurate. And yeah, we'll um, just go with the numbers that they tell us for now. <laughs> exactly. Um, so if that's the, if you have a range of 27% to, to 35%, and it's an individual cultivar, there's no genetic variance there. I, granted, I understand there's, um, there's viral issues and viral load and those different things. And there was one paper that I'm trying to search for in my archives that is very interesting on, on the subject of uh, mutations within clonal lines um but point being you don't have any genetic variance there you only have environmental variance and you can then determine the mean there and that mean at least lets you understand that across multiple different environments here's my mean for this particular cultivar that i'm breeding with and you can do that for a lot of different cultivars that already exist and the more that you have like networks of people who are sharing and growing and working on different cultivars and doing it in sort of a community way, you can really start to see the range of expression of particular cultivars that are being passed around. And that can help you account for the environmental variables that are going to impact or influence the phenotypic expression. Because again, phenotypes are cool, but they're not genotypes. They're the result of a lot of environmental variables and a lot of interactions between genes and environments. And just looking at that phenotype alone isn't sufficient to actually determine its breeding value. And that uh, does put a lot of time and effort into true breeding or proper breeding practices 
to, you know, because you can't speed this plant up and you have to try them. You mentioned COAs, cert certifi Certification of Authenticity, uh, which, you know, uh, again, we'll go back to Joe Bob in Minnesota with the official Sour D, the originator guy. Uh, all hypothetical again, guys. Um, but yeah, if he's turning out, you know, COAs on his particular cut, he, he does need to know how it handles the humidity in Florida and the dryness in Colorado and the moisture out here in Washington. Uh, because you would get different expressions. And if you don't know it, I mean, not not to throw a, a, a split in the tracks here, but that's a lot of the talk about OGs and Kush is just kind of like different variations in different areas of the country. Exactly. Exactly. And like that's OG is a great one because it's one of those it's a cultivar that people all across California have been growing for you know, decades. And so we all have our own different experiences with it. And, you know, it's great to hear people talk about OG who are like really been growing it in their area and are just adamant that it's different. And like, not necessarily that it's a different cut, but just like everybody loves their herb and, you know, growing it and talking about the expression of the traits. And it's just, it's one where when people talk about the environmental variables that produce particular expressions of the cultivar that we've all grown for so long, it's really enjoyable to hear. And it's something that like, you know, I'm only talking about the different microclimates from the Emerald Triangle to the Sierra foothills to the Central Coast down south, like every one of these different places is, you know, got its own little microclimates and they've all we've all rocked the OG really hard. And um, yeah, there's some people who swear it just loves that coastal environment. Other people who are like, no, it needs that really dry, arid, you know, some cuts perform better, like, you know, the fire OG versus the Tahoe, et cetera. Like it's, it's definitely uh, environmental variables are are really unique for us to look at just because we operate off of a population that is so much based. There's very limited genetic variety or variation going on when we're just passing cuts around. So we get to see some of these environmental influences that you may not see in other, uh, in other plant species as much. Cool. Cool. Thank you for elaborating on that one, because that is one that I do, you know, again, here here as environmental conditions coming into the conversation when you're talking origin stories. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, OK, approaches to estimating heritability. So we've gone over a bunch of these and we've gone over the parent offspring regression and address measuring a population response to selection across generations. It's similar business. We did not talk about covariance among relatives. Um, mostly it's the inbreeding coefficient. It's Seawall Wright's work from 1921. Uh, check it out. It's, it's very interesting theoretical work. Um, but so this is one of the reasons why we didn't actually get into it partially. Uh, so actual relatedness versus expected values from pedigrees. So values uh, for the coefficient of co-ancestry and the coefficient of fraternity obtained from pedigrees are expected values. These are theoretical, they're not actual. Due to random segregation of genes from parents, the actual va value or realization can be different. So. Random segre segregation and uh, another factor here is linkage. There's issues of linkage means that you don't have just like a purely, not everything's moving around um, according to the theoretical principles that Seawall Wright laid out in his, um, his 1921 paper. So, um, this gives theoretical, like an example. So you would expect that a full sib to have a uh, 0.5 inbreeding coefficient or yeah. 
of the full full subs. Um, yeah, yeah. However, one pair of the sibs may actually be more similar, 0. 0.6, and another less, say, 0. 0.3. So that 0. 0.5 of full sib uh, population in uh, their uh, inbreeding coefficient, it's the middle point between these two, so to speak. It's, it's an average. On average, um, so, uh, okay, sorry. Uh, the best way of talking about this or thinking about this is the back cross example. So you cube it, you back cross it four times, it's 99% the parent. This is where this type of uh, relatedness um, value just it falls apart. And it's because of linkage and linkage drag and the connections of traits on chrome or of the different alleles on the chromosomes. So the way that you overcome the fact that this is just a theoretical way of uh, determining relatedness or covariance and the way that you overcome some of the limitations and the labor intensiveness that we've been talking about in terms of having to do the parent offspring regression and looking at the response to selection over multiple generations, which requires growing out hundreds of plants over multiple generations and phenotyping all of them and doing mean analysis and regression analysis for all of these and correlation between the parents and the offspring. That's a lot of work. That's time intensive. And it's also, as we already looked, it's not perfect. It's, it doesn't tell you the breeding value of the particular phenotype that you're selecting or the number, you know, if you're selecting everything over X percentage of THC, your the mean of that grouping, that mean doesn't tell you the breeding value. So genomic selection uses this extra information. And that's really where we're going to transition to with the rest of the discussion. Um, so yeah, we went through a lot of shit. Um, I'm surprised that we got done with all the mathy stuff. Yeah, definitely got through the mathy stuff. I'm still here. I'm still taking notes, and we're making sense. So, and I know chat is following along too. Somebody had had brought up. Uh, it's like algebra all over again. It totally is like algebra, but I'm more interested in it this time. So <laughs> that makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Dude, yeah, yeah. You know, have they only brought the pop plants so. out? I know. Well, I talked, I talked with um, Dr. MJ Coco Wednesday. Uh, and he happens to be a professor as well, so he gets to teach people. And uh, it, it's amazing how you can motivate students sometimes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, totally. But yeah, um, it, so... Back, to, back to back to this. Back to you. You okay there? Don't don't choke live on camera, please. I'd feel real bad. <laughs> yep. Yeah, no. Just uh, just puff and tough while we go through. Um, so yeah, these are um, some traits and some uh, uh, authors who have written different papers on the quantitative trait inheritance and expression of sex determinism, um, cannabinoid ratio and quantity, terpene ratio and quantity, phase to maturity and flowering. And I think I've left these ones out because they're hemp related. And, you know, I, yeah, I don't really care. <laughs> but they're cousins. Yeah, yeah. You know, check it out. Uh, this Campbell is different than this Campbell, I believe. Um, and this is Brian Campbell. Uh, Brian Campbell worked for Phylos. I don't know if he still does, but this is uh, information that he did in his dissertation. And it's there's some cool stuff in it, um, even though it's still fuck Phylos. But, uh, you know, he definitely did. He did good work in his dissertation and his published a good paper as well. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it wasn't all a loss. <laughs> wasn't exactly. all a loss. And actually, we did we did get one question right here since since you're lighting up. Uh, they can't actually see it right now, but uh, Culture Rebel had asked what you token on this evening. Um, been a number of things. Uh, there was a really heavy Afghan leaner on the PKM10. Um, then there was a gas leaner on the TKM10. Uh, definitely preferred the gas leaner. Um, <laughs> and then I did something that's kind of a mystery. I don't know what it is. Uh, it's got some weird jack turps that are uh, fancy jack, as I like to call them. It's like terpinoline plus something that's got like, I don't know, it's got like tropical fruit flavors that I really like. I'm pretty sure okay. it's a Wilson cross. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it was, I liked it. And, um, now, yeah, I don't know what this one is. <laughs> All right. I rolled up like five joints before we started. And, Always uh, prepared. We were going to down. Yep. All right. Cool. I'll let you get back to it there, but hopefully that answers that for you, Culture Rebel. I'm uh, what am I on? I'm about to reload. I, I think I'm going Temple Runs. But all right, enough about me. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So sex determination. Uh, there are some really cool papers, and I'm going to talk about some of them. Cite them. Uh, we can get down and talk on like really dive into some of this stuff. Um, but uh, I'll also try and get it all together in another like folder link thing and people can hit me up for it. Um, so sex determination. In 2014, Anne Michelle Foucault, or, uh, uh, she published a series of papers as part of her dissertation examining sexual trait expression um, in Monotius Hemp. Um, Key things that she found were she confirmed that monoecious hemp plants have XX chromosomes. So if you have a hemp plant that produces both male and female parts, they cytologically, the chromosomes, are XX. They don't show up with a Y chromosome. So essentially you have male uh, flower expression on a plant that is chromosomally completely female. It's only got an X and an X chromosome. Um, Faux also identified an autosomal uh, QTL. Uh, QTL is a quantitative trait loci. This is all of the discussion now is focused on these things. Um, so this is a quantitative trait loci are the many different loci where there are alleles controlling a particular trait. They're distributed across the chromosomes and all of these different genes at these different loci influence the expression of the trait. And together, they're a QTL. So um, she identified an autosomal, so you have your sex chromosomes, and then you have the other chromosomes. All of the other chromosomes are the autosome. So in cannabis, it's like diploid 2N, X, uh, 10. So I think they're like 10 chromosomes. And, but it's a diploid plant. So there's like, it's really 20. Anyway, point being is that um, I lost my train of thought. Uh, uh, yeah, chromosomes are goofy as fuck. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way, to, good way to pull it back. Yeah, the, you're getting into diploids and the combinations of 10, and then now you've got 20, then all of a and sudden it compounds. What, it's the numbers, yeah. 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 So there are, we will get into that, and that's not all that important. The point is, is that what she found was that in the autosome, i.e. the parts that are not the sex-linked chromosomes, but are the rest of the genome, in those 
areas, she found a QTL that is associated with male flower expression in monoecious hemp plants. So this is really something that's associated with herming. And it's also tightly linked with genes associated with photosensitivity, which is an environmental factor that we all know contributes to herming, light lakes, things like this, disrupting the photo period. These are things that can cause the plant to start throwing out some male flowers on an otherwise female plant. So her work helped to kind of first establish this QTL, first establish that it was a QTL and that it existed on the autosome. This was a really important paper. Um, it didn't have a lot of, it was, didn't have the most uh, dense resolution in terms of genomic data. So there was questions about it after it first got published for a while. Um, but it got confirmed in 2020 by a paper um, published by Pettit et al. And they confirmed and expanded on Foe's findings, confirming both that sex expression is controlled in part by QTLs and that these QTLs are linked by genes associated with photosensitivity. Um, they specifically found, I think they looked at six, we'll, we'll look at it, but they, they found some very interesting QTLs and really confirmed what she had found. Um, then this mtDNA research uh, looked at the evolution of diocese and cannabis and reveals a very complex evolutionary history. Um, the most simple hypothesis would be that CMS or cytoplasmic male sterility would be the explanation for how there was divergence in the um, in the sexes and how diocese evolved. However, Doing the uh, mtDNA research, they weren't able to, they can't completely rule it out. There's a possibility that CMS still explains um, the evolution of male-female uh, divergence in cannabis, but it looks like it's a much more complicated story. And the much more complicated story seems to correspond to what we all know with the plant. The plant has a number of different environmental variables that can cause it to start throwing out male flowers on otherwise female plants. And it's probably a result of this complex adaptive evolution of diocese in the plant. It wasn't just something that was a a uh, more simple and straightforward process, but was instead one that was a lot more complicated. And also, if they don't find uh, the ability to, like, if c cytoplasmic male sterility just isn't in the genome at all and doesn't operate in cannabis, then they won't be able to use that the way that they have in corn breeding, um, which is how part of how they controlled breeding or it essentially facilitated the breeding process because they were able to no longer have to do very labor intensive breeding experiments by using cms in cannabis it has pretty obvious applications as well for commercial application um then this paper 2020 at all at all investigated the transcriptome data to identify genes associated with the expression of male flower cytol in cytologically female XX plants. Um, they identified multiple candidate genes, I think 15 overall. So here's the, shit, I should have been doing this the whole time. Uh, this is the faux paper. Um, this is the key findings that they had uh, or that they made. Um, sex expression in monoecious hemp varieties are quantitatively, uh, very quantitatively. Um, so essentially through this work and then through Pettit's work, we're now at least 
we've identified different genes that are associated with the susceptibility or the propensity for female, otherwise chromosomally female plants to produce male flowers. By being able to identify these, we can select against them. We might also find that selecting against them has unintended consequences. And part of that has to do with um, the fact that it's tightly linked to uh, perception and transduction of light and transcription factors well known to regulate flowering, which were identified in QTLs for flowering time traits. These genes um, are involved in the regulation of different phytohormones, specifically ox and gibberellic acid, were identified in the QTLs for sex determination. Sex determination QTLs were associated with the development of male flowers and female and thus female plants and thus with sex stability determination in monoecious plants. So this paper right here basically outlines the fact that there's links between light sensitivity and the mechanisms that control sex determination in female plants. And so again, we don't really know the degree to which we will be able to break those linkages because those linkages exist. And furthermore, we don't know the consequences of breaking those linkages necessarily. There may be a unintended uh, consequences to selecting against current on that level, uh, which is one of those paradoxes. Right. And, and, and I could definitely see that, you know, with a lot of just even like typical medicine uh, for, you know, humans like uptake inhibitors, things, you know, what well, we're blocking something in our brain. Uh, and then it's years later, we find out how the, the system really functions and worked together so yeah you, you can stop this particular chemical from flowing in the brain but little did you know it's responsible for some other ne necessary function of the plant or of the human in this case but that that pettit et al study um that'll be interesting i've got that one written down here so i mean they have identified the qtls and the photosynthesis photosensitivity because that, that's been one question, uh, you know, I get a lot and I don't expect you to have the answer here, but, you know, in the paper, I'm going to see if they touch on it. Um, but, you know, a lot of us, you know, you could say it's bro science, whatever, but photosensitivity, light leaks, we know that could cause herms. Um, but then the other side will always come back. It's like, well, bro, I grow under a street light or like there's outdoor plants that grow under a full moon. And so the last I heard was there was a study that was looking into the intensity and the spectrum and duration of light to trigger that type of effect. But essentially what they would be looking at is, are these QTLs is, is what it sounds like. And yeah, and they're looking at that gene inter environment interaction because there's all these different genes that are interacting with those environmental variables and all those environmental variables are also variable, you know, like the spectrum, the intensity, duration, etc. And so all of those variables then interact with the different multiple variables that exist on the genetic level. And these, these are like there's multiple genes and these genes are all linked together. And so that's why it's hypothesized by both Pettit and Foe that this is an explanation for why you're going, why you see these environmental reactions or response or these responses to the environment in terms of harms. Um, and also the Foe paper is very interesting. And I believe uh, Pettit, they both look at these variables over multiple environments. So you do get to, like, if you really dive into Foe's uh, dissertation, you get, a, you get to see how all the different stuff that we talked about in the first half is done by a scientist 
to look at a particular trait, evaluate that trait in relation to several other traits because, you know, she was working in hemp. So um, I believe the other traits she was looking at were um, flowering time and yield in uh, fiber. But her big, like the breakthrough or the the headline findings that she made were much more based on sex determinism. Um, this is the uh, mtDNA paper looking at um, trying to figure out how uh, how diOC evolved in cannabis essentially. And yeah, as I had mentioned, their results revealed no clear evidence that different reproductive patterns are due to easily identifiable CMS mutations, uh, cytoplasmic male sterility. Our results refute the simplest hypothesis that there was a single recent origin of diose in Minotia's ancestor. Instead, the story of evolution of diose is likely much more complex. Furthermore, explanation of the nuclear and mitochondrial genomes and their interaction is required to fully understand the mating strategies of cannabis. So there's still a possibility that cytoplasmic male sterility genes could be found in cannabis and could explain how females are female essentially and don't produce any male flowers or you know as relatively a few male flowers um if those genes are identified that will be something that is exploited when we talk about gmo if if no cytoplasmic male sterility genes are found in the interaction between the nuclear and mitochondrial genomes, the end result is that somebody's probably going to put it in there. And so this is this right here is a target for potential genetic modification in the future. Just throwing it out there. Interesting. Yeah, bookmark that one. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see when that happens. <laughs> so uh the Adal paper is really cool because this paper actually looked like they, ex I think they ex used STS or some sort of chemicals, but they basically induced male flowers on female plants and then did the testing of the genomics on the actual reverse uh, male flowers to try and see what the genes that were expressing were responsible for the expression of the male uh, flowers. So they found, revealed over 10,500 differentially expressed genes of which 200 potentially controlled masculization in female cannabis plants. These genes include transcription factors and other genes involved in male organ, i.e. anther and pollen development, as well as genes involved in phytohormone signaling and male biased phenotypes. The expression of 15 of these genes were further validated by qPCR assay, confirming similar expression patterns to that of the RNA sequence data. These genes would be useful for understanding predisposition to harming, basically. So this paper is very, like, granted, it's limited to, I believe, an individual cultivar. It's not like looking at all populations. Mm -hmm. or a large population and it's using chemicals to induce uh, male flower expression but by doing that you're able to see the different uh, analyze the transcriptome the rna sequencing data and understand what is essentially how are these genes expressing in a way that's producing this male flower in this female plant and yeah, and they found 15 target genes. So that gives us 15 targets to either, you know, eventually someday select for or against, you know, because like the crazy thing in hemp also, the reason why uh, Bo was doing her analysis of Minotius, like sexual expression in Minotius hemp was because the point was to make her. Huh, that's interesting. So to obviously to, to counteract the potential of HERMS, these 15 genes are definitely of interest. 
would these 15 genes also be of interest for people trying to build sterile plants like sterile females um maybe not really okay not necessarily because these genes are more focused on the ones that cause the female to produce the male expression okay so it, these are the ones that are these transcripts in particular are the ones that tell the dna don't don't go female and produce you know all of the different trait architecture and plant architecture for a female flower go in the direction of producing a male flower and okay. Okay. so these genes are ones that are much more likely to do that and i mean the fact that they were able to find 200 genes that potentially not all of them but potentially control masculinization of female cannabis plants like if we're dealing with 15 genes, that's a fuck ton of genes. And if you look at the number of, like, when you start pulling out the your Robert Allard or your Seawall Wright and analyzing what your selection intensities have to be when you're selecting for or against 15 genes, I mean, it's fucking crazy. Um, and 200's, like, bonkers. So, you know, we're dealing with pretty large quantitative traits here. There's a lot of genes that play into both the morphology aspects, but this shit in particular, the phytohormone signaling, all of the male bias phenotypic type expression. We were talking a lot about the stuff on the, uh, on the breeding round table this week and specifically how some of these male bias phenotype or trait expression is things like stretch and like why gibberellic acid is used is to try and induce that expression and, or that extension in the plant so that you actually get what, you know, male flowers are much more extended. They're not really tightly compact nodules. And so part of that is just trying to, you know, chemically manipulate the plant using an exogenous hormone to induce a response in the plant. But these genes, once you start getting into signaling for hormones, you start involving a lot of different uh, metabolic pathways and different genes that are going to be involved. And that's why these things are just, it's so much more complicated than talking about Mendel or, you know, most of the breeding books that we look at because once we start getting at this level you know it's either a lot of statistics or uh phds and people with lab coats who you pay money to basically run these qpcr essays right right okay okay that yeah that, that makes sense there <clears throat> But it's still, I mean, it's knowledge and we get, we can apply this stuff still. And this gives us an idea, like the fact that we're honing in on male, gen on the genetics that produce male trait expression in female plants gives us way more saliency just on how this shit works, because that's so much like that's incredibly valuable and it gives us the ability to understand that if you have herms in your population that doesn't mean that you can't use these methods that we've gone over to select against that to move away from those traits and to experience the gains you know like if we're talking about a mean expression of five percent let's say of your populate of the um population is expressing herms and then you select away from that constantly and you're able to look at those mean regressions i hopefully you're able to and you know talking to people who have done long-term breeding programs to try and get away from herms and things like gg4 uh, gorilla glue 4 or different things like that they've done exactly that they've intensively selected done negative selection against herm traits and for non-herming 
expression and experience significant gains and moved away from her. Or um, David Watson talks about it um, for the Durban poison and leading that away from a very intersex population to a much more stable population. That's interesting. I, I didn't know about that, uh, but Durban poisons rumored to be one uh, uh, in the lineage of, of a few strains that I kind of, I don't know, I, I, I make fun of cookies a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and uh, <laughs> you know, there, there's many reasons for it, but I, I like to knock the Herm factor of it. And I actually see Flora Nugs uh, in, in chat right now. He's a person who sends me lovely shots of cookie strains all the time like he, he's got the good ones but to 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 bring it back to the point um you know i had finally after years of asking different people the same answer james loud on his show uh kind of got gave me the answer of like well you know it can be bred out you know exactly like you're just saying here but for me that was kind of the first time i heard it because you know don't we're, we'll edit this out at the end uh, not that we can really edit, but, you know, cookies have some really fire and stable stuff. Uh, and it wasn't always that way. And there's still a lot of it that sucks. Um, but no, there, there are some that are totally stable. Whereas before it was like, t t you know, a new strain every run because you got fresh seeds. But uh, yeah. yeah, so the, so knowing this is is the way to statistically or use data to breed away from those things which is exactly what he was saying uh, happened, probably happened with a few of the better breeders working that line. Okay. Yeah. And also I should point out that they found 15 target genes here that were associated with um, male flowers and female plants. That doesn't mean that every one of these 15 genes is necessarily the most responsible or the best target for addressing um, or breeding away. Some of these, you're gonna have a much higher heritability in terms of your ability to breed away from them than others. For instance, um, if the heritability on this subset is different than the heritability on this subset, your selection here is going to be much more effective than your selection here. And you can go for this trait. They talk about this in um, cannabinoid inheritance, that it's possible that copy um, number variants, the number of THC synthase genes that are in the overall uh, plant, that those could explain the percentage of THC. It doesn't necessarily explain it. And that one of the better explanations, instead of the number of variants that synthase, that synthesize THC, you need a lot of the precursor, the things in the uh, upstream, in the, excuse me, in the metabolic pathway that make it so that the plant can produce THC in the first place. Because THC is the end of the metabolic system so to speak you know that's one metabolic pathway and it's kind of the conclusion it can go thc or cbd and those are the end results of a lot of different metabolic exchanges that happen earlier and upregulating for those other genes may be more effective for increasing overall thc and mm -hmm. same thing here yeah okay and, and it does it sounds like you know again i don't uh understand all of this but if it follows a similar pattern you know those 15 genes it could be a rubik's cube of combinations that mm -hmm. bring out the expression kind of like you're saying i i think you're saying it, it may not just be one particular one but it, there always seems to be variables with all of these so it's probably a, again a rubik's cube of combinations there oh Okay, so that was uh, most, mostly male trait expression in otherwise female plants is a quantitative trait that exists on the autosome. And, you know, ideally people are selecting against it, but there are, it's incredibly complicated and there's some serious linkages there to other traits that are key to, you know, 
the overall function of the plant, like flowering time and sensitivity to light. So terpenes. Terpenes are, like we said, one of those genes or subset of genes that exist in a whole lot of different variety or species of plants. Um, broadly speaking, there are six subfamilies of uh, what are known as TPS. Uh, terpene synthase genes are abbreviated as TPS. Um, these TPSs are, uh, the subfamilies are listed A through F, so it's TPS A, B, C, D, E, F, G, or excuse me, F, huh? Uh, there are over 35 TPS genes that have been identified in cannabis. This was, there are, this is a really interesting fact. Individual TPS genes can produce more than one terpene expression. Oftentimes they produce a major product and then minor product. So it'll be a, it primarily produces myrosine or pinene or terpinaline, but then other terpenes will be minor products that are also created by these genes. So this is kind of, this is like, a much more leaky THC synthase sort of idea where um, in THC CBD ratios, it's understood that even when you have, you know, quote unquote, pure CBD varieties that only have non-effective THC gene synthase, for whatever reason, there's still minute amounts of THC that end up in the, in the, uh, products or the end pro uh, and field results. And those can sometimes trigger, you know, hot batches in hemp. Um, that's from the leaky synthase gene that's going on in terpenes as well. Um, so terpenes and cannabinoids rely on similar metabolic pathways and precursors as well. So there's potentially, I believe, um, uh, Ryan, uh, Chimera and Napro did some analysis and they saw like a 15% variance or correlation in the variance um, associated between these two. So essentially the cannabinoids and the terpenes are competing on some level that can express or that can uh, that can, is represented by about 15% of the variance, but then the other 85% of the variance has nothing to do with the fact that these are essentially competing over the same pathways and molecules. Um, so then, and space as well. Uh, so then linkage maps elucidate genetic architecture of the TPS genes, at their location on chromosomes. So we'll see some of these at the end. So here's, Here's a bunch of the literature. Um, terpene expression and inheritance is part of a complex set of traits that are quantitatively and qualitatively expressed and transmitted across generations. Uh, Camaro was talking about this. You will still see discrete segregation in terpene values. So they do kind of uh, differentiate similar to your quote unquote traditional Mendelian dynamics. And if you have, there are some, there are some terpenes that aren't found in certain varieties because they haven't been bred into them. Theoretically, they could be bred into them, but the non-existence of a terpene can make it so it's a discrete segregating population that doesn't necessarily conform to a true pure bell curve. Um, but there are over, like I mentioned, there are over 35 terpene uh, synthase genes that have been identified in cannabis. This is the literature. We'll go over a bunch of it. This is a nice graph that was made by NAPRO and published in their 2016. Um, it was a slideshow that they, uh, somehow I found it. I don't know where I found it, but uh Anyway, this shows maximum terpenes was 2.4%. Uh, minimum was 0.6%. Average 0 0.5, 1.5. Um, 
Okay, so shows different variations from the various lots. Um, terpene variability is greater than cannabinoid variability. Um, here's the Booth paper. Booth, uh, Ryan mentioned Judy Booth. Her work from 2017 to 2020 has really been, I think she's done the majority of terpene synthase uh, um, genomic work. She's identified, I believe, 35 different um, terpenes or TPSs. Um, so this was her early paper in 17. She looked at Phenola, which is a hemp variety, and found nine cannabis terpene synthase genes um, in just two subfamilies, A and B. Um, so yeah, and these are the specific myrosine osamine, limonene, pinene, caryophylline, and humulene. Um, she expanded on this work and did an additional analysis on purple kush. Purple kush, the genome was published by Van Backel in 2011, and it's been the subject of a lot of analysis because that genome essentially has been available to people to then do the, like we said, these terpene genes, they're a family of genes that exist in a lot of different plants. So you can look for the analogs in cannabis. And she's done that. And she was able to identify 33 different cannabis terpene synthase genes in the purple kush uh, genome. So... Uh, So yeah, this paper, this did a lot more work and really developed the overall number of genes that had been identified. Then her dissertation um, is really worth reading. Uh, I would check this out if you, well, I mean, I've got links for it. It's freely available. Um, but here she goes very in depth and looks at a lot of different um, terpenes and yeah, I think it's six chapters. Um, so, and it, yeah, it just, it goes further in depth and talks about more varieties and more terpenes. Um, and I believe there's one chapter on can, uh, cannabinoids. Um, so Booth's work was like foundational to uh, terpene synthase genes. Uh, this is a way out of focus picture, but this shows um, the idea that different specific terpene synthase genes, TPSs, have both major and minor uh, products that they produce. So the major product of uh, cannabis, CS is cannabis, TPS is terpene synthase, F1, FN is a reference to phenola. So the major product of that gene was limonene, minor products were pinene and alpha pinene and beta pinene, as well as myrosine and terpinaline. She goes on to demonstrate this with a number of different genes. And as you can see, each one of these genes not only regulates or produces limonene or these other terpenes, or excuse me, it also produces these others. So when you have, you're not just inheriting a limonene gene when you inherit this gene, you're inheriting the production of as many as four to five other terpenes as well that will happen in minor amounts. So, and then you know, this is where you really get into a very, very complicated inheritance scheme and a very complex additive. Um, this is where you have to do variance analysis, and that's where you're going to need to look into R.A. Fisher's work. And analysis of variance is uh, an idea that he developed, but there's a specific set of mathematical principles that actually help you break down the fractions so that you can calculate for the major, uh, 
product that's produced by these different genes as well as their different constituents as well as the fact that their different constituents are all different you know here you've got a major um producer of alpha pinene with minor amounts of these and then you've got this one producing a single detectable product so this one only produced myrosine um, when exposed to gpp gpp is a precursor that's involved in the synthesis path or the metabolic pathway that uh, synthesizes uh, terpenes so anyway this really shows even though it's kind of blurry, the incredible complexity of the trait expression of terpenes. It would seem so because there isn't a, a consistent factor there. You know, at first with the, the TPS2, uh, you know, it made a major and then some minors. And in my head, I'm kind of like, okay, it's more of a factory than a mold. You know, it can put out a bunch of things versus one specific, but then the TPS3 specifically to myrcene so then that one would be kind of like the mold um so yeah just just does go to share or show a lot of the variability in these types of things and and if we get to a good point have have one uh a good question in chat about the masculine masculinizing genes masculine yeah. um good good chance to interject that one real quick okay Okay, awesome. And, you know, it just raised my head. It was uh, Micah Perry um, said if, if the community bred and, you know, if we go in and we do, um, you know, take a look. And again, we're assuming that these 15 genes are the or well, 200 genes. Actually, there were 200 genes in that study for the masculine masculinizing. OK, I'll give up on saying that word. Um, but the question <laughs> was, if we as a community bred out the masculinizing genes, would that mean that reversing females for pollen wouldn't be possible anymore? Or at least would it make it more difficult? Yeah, yeah, it would. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Because I mean, these are the genes that they found doing exactly that process. So if we selected against those genes and removed them from the population, wow. we would potentially be eliminating the possibility to do reversals. Now, you know, it, it's a very, this, this right here is a wild beast, you know, once you start dealing with phytohormones, um, you know, the, the plants are, I mean, fuck, I don't, I haven't looked into it, but I just saw that condors asexually reproduced. I don't know okay. if it's true, but if that's fucking true, it's fucking crazy because supposedly there was males in the like mating population nearby so like theoretically they at least could have mated but they chose or like you know figured out somehow to asexually reproduce which is the first time in birds that's ever fucking happened Crazy. Yep. and if you've ever watched jurassic park they <laughs> will find a way <laughs> but that's interesting though because again i know they're they're looking at at breeding plants with no you know that can't get pollinated and then mm -hmm. if they were to remove those particular genes then somebody truly could put something to market that you couldn't reproduce or copy you had to buy fresh seeds every time yeah, in, yeah. okay in, in my grand conspiracy yeah. mindset there okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's but no, so that's i mean that's a really really great question and point to bring up that like theoretically if you were to select particularly against that subset of genes that made it possible for that expression to happen, then yeah, you would be eliminated. The awesome. ability to reverse using, uh, I believe it was, I'm off the top of my head, not having the full paper in front of me, I'm pretty sure it was silver that they, uh, uh, silver thiosulfate that they used for the reversal to then do the experiment and see the the transcriptome genes that were associated with it. So um, Livingston, Livingston basically builds on um, the same thing with uh, uh, Booth, really looking at different specific terpene synthase genes, um, ones that produce osamine. Um, all of these are very similar, honestly. Um, Zanger uh, or Zager in 2017 has also um, 
was able to identify and uh, evaluate some other genes that hadn't been um, identified, specifically this, uh, the linalool and nerolidol, um, yeah. And these ones down here at the bottom, they, these are the genes that they specifically identified in their study that were different from the genes that had been identified by, um, by Booth. And so with all of these different genes taken together, you've got a, I believe we've got a composite of 30 different target terpene genes that have been identified and theoretically because they've been identified markers and um, assays could be created for these so essentially you could identify the presence of these genes in a vegetative plant without having to grow it all the way out through the completion granted as we've said environment is a massive variable in the expression of these traits mm -hmm. so like you know take that for what it's yep. worth but at least knowing the presence or absence of the genes is possible and that is interesting on the surface just for the simple fact yeah. that you you know or you could get a good picture of what the profile is going to be without having to grow it out and if that's not something that is hot on the market or whatever then you know toss it or if it's common toss it you might be able to find the, the outliers that way and you keep it and you keep running it because again it's it, it's people with budgets that are going to have information or, or this type of information at hand to make these type of decisions it's not uh it's not me in my closet true but also as i was sitting here thinking about it i was like you know steep hill back in the day you know a decade ago they were fucking using the Mandolino and uh, Shoyama fucking papers on markers for male sex expression. The uh, male, I think they're called MAD or M-A-D-C. Um, basically, they found markers associated with male sex expression, and that's what the first sex kits were based off of essentially fucking steep hill yeah they had some money but they didn't have crazy money back in the day like 2008 2010 yeah. whatever it was like they weren't fucking no we're not talking million million millions and millions of dollars in startup funds like they had some rudimentary lab equipment and they went and they did it and they did it using studies like this. So if you were able to acquire the different lab equipment that is needed to run the PCRs or QPCRs, you could do these assays in house and you could screen your own populations and wow. find these genes. Or you okay. could also make a fucking like, you know, a, a, company and sell your like so much i wanted to like mention this like so much of the gene editing biotechnology patents 90 percent of that's just a fucking shell game or like a pump and dump strategy where it's like look we've got value if you build out a company and you have you have the lab equipment and you build out the company and you provide early terpene testing there's i mean perhaps medicinal genomics is doing it i'm not entirely sure there's a number of different people in the cannabis space quote unquote that are offering sex kits etc mm -hmm. they're right now they could take the same information and start developing these marker assays wow. and doing this for people and being able to tell you whether or not you're you've got the synthase for linalool. Now that's not going to tell you yes or no you've got linalool. That's just going to tell you whether or not you've got this specific terpene synthase. Here. Well, that's cool. That sounds like it's a lot closer to for us as a real possibility then to to benefit. 
Totally. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, check out medicinal uh, genomics because they had qPCR kits where, like, instead of sending your sex kit into Phylos or some other company, they would essentially send you, like, a test tube kit and you could do this, like, little lab experiment at home and determine the sex of your plants. And there's ways, and, like, my homie Bam, uh, Bollywood Bam, he, he was somebody who I did a lot of this early studying with and has done, actually done the lab side of things. I didn't do the lab side of the uh, courses, but he, he has, and he has experience with that stuff. And he treats it like, you know, we talk about this stuff and I've for a long time been like, oh man, that's, that's an extra next level shit. And he's like, nah, dude, like just fucking get your lab fucking protocols and your fucking cleanliness on point. Don't fucking contaminate your shit and you'll be fine. Huh. Well, yeah. And that's, you know, I think kind of where Steep Hill came out running, uh, you know, without the super, super millions of dollars is they had passionate people who were really, really curious and they didn't have some answers to things and they kind of blazed blazed their trail. I don't know the full story to be completely honest, but just from an outsider perspective, um, you know, that's that's kind of it wasn't it wasn't the shell game. It wasn't like, okay, if we get this building, we get all this equipment, then we can sell it to an investor because we got the license. They were actually trying to to solve something. Yeah, no, it was like, fuck, we have to take investors. Fuck, this really sucks. Investors are the worst. Why can't we just do cool shit? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm a scientist, like, because you know, Reggie, he's, and um, I forget the older dude's name, but like, they had cool cats there that like you'd go in and you'd talk to them, and you wouldn't just like talk like you know. Now I'd be stoked to go in and talk like sciencey shit, but like you could talk weed shit with them, and they were like heads, like they knew just as much on that side of things as they did on the science side of things. So it was like early steep hill days were really cool in terms of the scientific team that was there and like, you know, a little over a decade ago. And uh, Reggie was one of those people and bam, he did work there in terms of just like doing some lab experiments and, um, uh, the holy banana work that really actually the uh, the freak show came out of a breeding population that Bam did that uh, was run through some genetic testing through Steep Hill. And it was part of an experiment that he had constructed of to try and identify the uh, cannabinoid, cannabinoid uh, the THC synthase of the the particular population they were working with which was holy banana wow that's interesting because that that's something that i have in my my uh tent right now is a couple freak shows and while it was slow to grow um it was just fun it's like it's like a guar concert everybody should do it at least once everybody should do it once (laughs) twice (laughs) okay there you go i go twice yeah, no, Guar, greatest, uh, yeah, it's top five easy greatest shows. Yeah, but uh, so, no, um, and we're hopefully working on bringing on Canon Research and going to talk about Freak Show and stuff like that because that's all part of that time period and that those plants ended up at the uh, farmer's market, like, Basically, Bam did a huge population. He had leftovers. He wasn't going to grow out all of them, but had done, like, some of the genetic sampling from them and then, like, hit people up on the gram and was like, you know, I got all these. Like, get at me. I'm going to be at the the farmer's market. And so Canna Research and Canna H2O went up there, and uh, they met up with Bam. They got the plants. They then brought them back. They had some other stuff they were working with. I think it was Pineapple Express um, from, I'm not even G13 Labs, I think. But anyway, they made their cross. The dad was involved and 
they all worked on it together and have like bred that variety and like they brought that to the community. It's a unique thing. It's uh, somebody asked about it earlier today and asked about you know talking about it and was quick to point out like that they knew that it was a a qualitative. Uh, trait more so than a quantitative trait, but that's something that's really, really interesting, and I'm glad that we figured out a way to work it in. Yeah, it's it's it. That's a very good one, a good visual example to use when distinguishing between those two, because uh, it's it's unique for sure. Yeah, yeah, and also we just grew out um, a bunch of the holy banana this year, and there are just freaks in that line, like. Uh, this was an open <laughs> pollination. It wasn't holy banana. It's like holy banana crossed to a whole bunch of other stuff from the homie Just Peros bread. But uh, it um, some absolutely amazing phenos in there. The uh, there was one though that had uh, it was trifoliate from the very beginning, and it maintained its trifoliate structure at least until six feet i stopped paying oh, wow. attention at that point yeah it oh was like super branchy and one of the branches had a like intense variegation like yellow just like oh. albino branch basically there was huh. a little strip of green on part of it but it was like basically 60 percent or more maybe even like 75 percent yellow branch that's weird i have not run into that yet yeah it did it all the way through flower um and so yeah definitely it's a line that has some unique it, it has the ability to throw things up that are just really really unique i I'd, I'd assume so i mean there has to be so many recessive things locked into that particular strain just to get it uh, the way it is again, I, I only put down two. I got two different morphological. One looks a little bit more like the ABC. The other looks like the fern type freak show. Uh, the fern type freak show has more of a gassy profile. The one that was more ABC is a lot more fruity. So I did get some differences, but uh, fun and freaks either way. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> so Kevin McKernan, um, mentioned him just a minute ago and reggie godino that's reggie godino is steep hill um kevin mckernan is medicinal genomics <coughs> um mckernan at all in 2019 they did a genomic characterization of a complete terpene synthase gene family so <coughs> this is a good paper um it just adds more information uh so they identified 55 terpene, terpene synthases. Um, they did not identify 55 TPSs, just to be clear. These are the actual synthases. They analyzed the genomic com content. So the overall number, to my, to my knowledge, that has been identified of TPSs is 35. Um, but there are much more than just 35 terpenes, if that makes sense. There's like hundreds of terpenes. Yeah, I think over, over 200 was the number I saw last, and that was a recent study. Yeah, but yeah, so there's, exactly, there's like, there are tons of terpenes, but they've identified 35 terpene genes, and... Here, they've identified 55 terpene synthases with genomic content. That's not the same as TPSs, as far as I, I'm aware. Um, now, this is a different type of paper. So, uh, Mudge, in 2019, published her dissertation, as well as a, an interesting paper. And this looks at chemometrics and metabolomics. So... Um, in it, she basically, the thing, uh, if Booth doesn't find, wasn't able to find genes for terpinoline in some of her earlier work, and so terpinoline's an under, 
represented terpene in Booth's work. Mudge was able to find some uh, terpinolene expression, some unique factors associated with terpinolene expression. And I quoted part of her uh, thesis because it talks specifically about it. But um, there was a strong indication of a unique biosynthetic pathway for the synthesis of terpinolene, nine additional monoterpenes, and their identified cannabinoids. Isolation and characterization of the most prominent cannabinoid identified was THCAC4 with a butyl side chain. Um, another correlated cannabinoid was identified as THCBA. <clears throat> These two cannabinoid are present in higher quantities in the presence of terpinolene, suggesting that breeding for increased terpinolene production switches on the biosynthesis of terpinolene in some traits. So this is something that's very interesting in terms of identifying, well, one, that this seems to be a trait that switches on and off in relation to a particular threshold of cannabinoid production, and two, that terpinolene expression is associated with this high THC production. That's, it's one of those things, I have a friend, uh, his name's Reggie Weed, man, he's he took a bunch of classics down, like all the great cuts, the Urkels, the OGs, all the flavors, took them down to um, Maui and had seeds and stuff and a lot of good clone only varieties that he brought, that he had sent to him. And he came back and he brought all this, these different flavors and he would open all these jars of really incredible herb and he's like, I don't know, man. All roads lead to Jack. <laughs> I've heard that. Yep. I've heard that before. Well, it'd be interesting if, you know, we were talking earlier, the ter terpene synthase genes, if you found the one uh, for terpenaline, uh, and then you found that in the early tests of the vegging plant, then you could almost assume that that plant might have increased uh, cannabinoid production just because it sounds like from Mudge, the two go hand in hand. Yeah, and I think that it's like, I think really what she was finding is this really extreme uh, expression. And that part of, I, I would say that sort of the uh, Neville's hazes kind of represent this to a certain extent, because I mean, some of them are just like disgusting to finally intense herbs but then you fucking smoke them and as much as you may not necessarily like that terpene mm -hmm. it's fucking insanely potent like some of the most racy potent herb that you've ever smoked and you can see where the like potency and terpinoline expression seem to be associated on some level now they don't necessarily like it's not necessarily a one-to-one. -one. Myrcene is by far the most, it's the predominant terpene across all cannabis. But terpinoline is a beast and seems to, seems to dominate a large subset of high-potency cannabis and that the other subset of high-potency cannabis is dominated by myrcene. And that's interesting. We could be staring at the answer for that right now with that just that mm -hmm. connection in the paper mm -hmm. yeah okay so this i mentioned this a little bit earlier um this really goes into the specifics of the uh metabolic pathways that produce terpenes and cannabinoids so this is the metabolic pathway that leads to sesquiterpenes this leads to monoterpenes and right here, you'll see that this is the same precursor that is necessary for CVG, which is the precursor for essentially, you know, all terpenes. <laughs> Excuse me, cannabinoids, cannabinoids. Uh, so, yeah, this is just to demonstrate that there's 
every one of these has genes regulating them. Every one of these has environmental variables that interact with those genes. All of this is an incredibly complicated set of genetic factors and environmental variables that produce the end result. The um, One of the things that we'll get to um, in one of the later papers here, uh, I think it's Grassa, or Grassa um, that perhaps selecting for things that increase these different precursors and the amino acids that are produced upstream from the actual cannabinoids um, will improve overall THC or, you know, if you're trying to breed for increased potency or increased numbers of a particular cannabinoid, that increasing selection for these things and for these things that produce more of this and more of this will end up producing a higher percentage of this over selecting for more copy number variants of just this, if that makes sense. Um, so then here, this is an older version. Now, granted, I believe this is from Booth, but this shows a linkage map on the chromosomes. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 chromosomes. These different uh, colored numbers are, you know, alphanumerics and their lines indicate different either terpene synthase or isoprenoid biosynthase or cannabinoid uh, biosynthase uh, genes and where they map onto the chromosomes. This is a very early model. It's a little bit more refined than the type that you'll see in the early Dima hair papers. Um, here's a more recent one. I believe, yeah, this was from Livingston in uh, 2020. Um, again, you can see chromosome three here, uh, chromosome six, uh, chromosome seven. You, there's uh, total cannabinoids, percentage of THC, percentage of CBG, percentage of CBD, and percentage of CBC, and where they map onto the chromosome. Um, here is a more in-depth uh, terpene and cannabinoid map. So again, these are, this is something that can now be done very quickly in a single, in a single experimental trial. Um, doing this type of linkage map as, uh, assembly for a crop years ago would have taken a long, long, long time. And so we're able, you know, the fact that we're having our, our crop of interest come online at a time when we have advanced genomics, we're able to find these assembly or develop these assembly maps much more quickly and theoretically use these because each one of these is a different marker. And each one of these markers is also part of a linkage group that you can then evaluate their inheritance and their presence in a population. So when you're saying, if you're able to look for one trait, does it give you some sort of indication of the presence of another trait? Not 100%, but this right here, all of these genes are together. And the presence of this gene increases the likelihood of the presence of this gene because they're linked and they're part of a linkage group. So it's not a, a hundred percent, like it's not like, you know, male, female sex kits aren't a hundred percent either, but like just assuming they were a simple binary, yes, no, or male, female, it's not that simple, but it gives you some degree of indication of relation. Um, there's a lot more work that's gone into um, cannabinoid expression and inheritance. Uh, early work was primarily done by Dima Hare 
and he proposed a single locus with a co-dominant allele. So this was the B locus with a BT and a BD allele. This explained the distribution of the one, two, one, where you have one pure THC chemotype, uh, then you have two mixed chemotypes, and then one pure CBD chemotype in an F2 population when you cross two inbred type one and type three cannabis lines. Um, this was the first early experiment and uh, explanation for inheritance and trait and uh, trait expression and in cannabis. But this was wrong. But Dima Hare, I don't want to give the impression that like there wasn't any reason for them to come away with this conclusion. Like the math, this is the simplest most parsimonious sort of explanation of what they were seeing in the data. And they also, they maintain the possibility for an alternative explanation being a quantitative inheritance as opposed to just a traditional Mendelian with co-dominant alleles type system. Um, Van Backel, uh, in 2011, published the pure, uh, Purple Kush genome and transcriptome. This has led to an early, uh, early hypothesis of two locus model for um, cannab cannabinoid inheritance. And they also were the first, I believe, to propose that there were non-functional genes encoding for THC and CBDA synthase, and that this was determinative in the outcome of phenotype expression. Um, and then Weeblin et al. confirmed and extended the findings of both authors, which can be kind of uh, counterintuitive, but they were able to extend the findings of Ben Backel and the hypothesis of a multiple locus, non-functional functional allele. And they were also able to confirm just the pheno or chemotypic segregation and distribution of Dima hairs. So it's one of those things where the, the overall phenotype data that people were looking at very much indicated a segregating population that was operating on some level on a qualitative inheritance scheme. But, and you know, that was the early studies. They all kind of like, they're all op operating and talking in that sort of universe. Um, after the Weebland paper in 2015, shit got way fucking complicated. And we'll get into that. And it's interesting. <laughs> way complicated. I love that. Yeah. Definitely. We're, I think we're, we're all in agreement there. But uh, some, sometimes you're only as good as the information you're working with. And so as time goes on, we learn new things, able to test for new things. And yeah, that it progresses, progresses the knowledge. Yeah, yeah. No, that's so true. Like, I think the Indica Sativa thing is such a, like, product of the 1970s. And it's not that, like, you know, you had science-minded people reading the science of the day. And you had the Schultz paper and you had the small paper. That was the available information. You yep. know? And Schultz was way cooler. Not going to lie. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. He may not have been as like scientifically rigorous, but like he was ahead. He was legit. Um, so this shows, this is again NAPRO. Uh, Camaro worked with NAPRO. NAPRO did some research, a lot of research. They did really large, massive testing of cannabis in the commercial, independent testing on their own. They went and bought a, a bunch of samples um, from all the different clubs during the 215 days. They brought all these samples back and they tested all these samples to see, you know, THC, the cannabinoid expression as well as the uh, terpenes. We saw the slide earlier that was from there. And they were able, they used this and they did a lot of the work and 
terms of doing the genetic information, the environmental information, and the phenotypic envi- uh, expression and tracking that and being able to really do the sort of regression analysis that's necessary to track the breeding value or, you know, the, uh, the breeder's equation that we talked about earlier. And so this was part of that process. And this was really this data set right here comes from sort of their early R and D where they were going through and just looking at the, what was available on the commercial rec market. And really they're also some of the people that found that, uh, the rec market was highly skewed towards myrosine dominant terpenes and that there was a significant lack of caryophylline, particularly caryophylline type two varieties. And they ended up producing some varieties. They also got some patents um, that were very controversial. And they also won some cups at the Emerald Cup, um, which was also very controversial. Um, But that was the business Biotech Inc., I believe, that was a customer that worked with NAPRO. So they're separate entities, just to be clear. But NAPRO did the scientific research that helped to facilitate the breeding program that ended up producing those results. Okay, so this right here is not a great data set but it's a data set. It shows these are potency trends from confiscated cannabis samples from 1995 to 2019. Uh, This right here marks hemp legalization, so yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's interesting that there is a dip, but hemp, yeah. Yeah. Okay, and and you would think though confiscated goods would actually be somewhat of an accurate reflection of what was going on in the market it's not it's not the mississippi university stuff it it is and it isn't um i didn't include all of the this one shows the clearest trend line and so i cheated uh i could have picked there were two other um images that are much more complicated and i think part of it is that uh, I can't be entirely sure. I didn't really look at the um, at the data set again. It's been a while since I really looked at this about a year ago or six months ago. But um, the data just looked fucking stupid. It looked like for domestic samples, the trend line for here was down like this, like way. Like the reason this line technically is depressed the way that it is. Mm-hmm. is because there was this trend line that basically stays stable and static at like below five percent and i was like the fuck like nah uh who's smoking that and i think it goes to like here actually technically and the difference is that they stopped eradicating ditch weed at that point so i think they were fucking up the data on domestic cannabis by including ditch weed in their sample set so you have like this here where you have a much higher rate of three percent or under thc varieties i think part of that is being skewed by ditch weed but that said this trend line when they stop doing that still shows the same fucking thing which is a fucking just astronomic curve like yeah there's a dip but like here you know what that dip is this is this kind of correlates pretty closely to the people really fucking figured out what cbd was okay 2010 to 2012 was like early project cbd time like maybe 2008 2009 the very first samples were tested in the california rec market but like here you have some leveling off, and then you have an enormous fucking takeoff, which is correlated to fucking, or, you know, associated with the California rec market coming online, it looks like. But basically, the point is, is that these, this trend line shows significant increase in THC. 
we all know that there was significant pressure for selecting THC. We also know that nobody was doing regression analysis or, you know, very few people were doing <laughs> regression analysis on large scale populations, but were instead doing recurrent selection for really when you talked about what's XD and what's the importance of the X, XB or whatever in the, um, the selection differential in the breeder's equation, just by constantly selecting in the higher upper threshold of THC percentage as a phenotype, usually through a bioassay of people, you know, had smoke and shit, we were able to create this sort of gain in the trade expression. You know, all things being equal and recognizing this is an imprecise data set, you know, this is by no means a actual study where you can make a one-to-one -one causal claim. But you can see the trend line here and the intense increase in THC percentage. And if you break it down this data, like the highest THC percentages were actually like, there was some crazy 30, high 30s uh, in the mid 90s that happened. So like, it doesn't just track to where it's like, you know, oh, now, now everything's over here. Like you can see where different high THC varieties have been um, sampled in the population or out of these samples and very low as well. It's, it's, this all comes from uh, the University of Mississippi's fucking program on tracking potency, which is all, again, kind of what we talked about earlier today at the start where we were talking about how a lot of this information has been tracked by the cops. And the information that we have is, you know, kind of determined by their interest. Yeah, not always fully invested and accurate as long as it gets a conviction. But so serves as a guideline, serves as a guide. Yeah. Um, so this is Hillig and uh, Malberg. They really just point out that there's a qualitative and quantitative um, dynamic to... Uh, cannabinoid inheritance or expression. And really the qualitative characterization involves determining a plant's uh, ratio. So the chemotype, that idea of like, it's a one-to-one -one mixed chemotype, that's a qualitative characterization, making a characterization of a pure THC or a pure CBD or a pure CBG variety all of those are chemotypic distinctions that are qualitative. They're, they're isolating the different qualities of the traits that are discrete qualities that they either do or do not have, or you know, they're either a mixture of the two in the terms of the mixed chemotype or they're divergent. Um, he also addresses the qualitative nature of the trait. I think it's been very, this whole idea that Dima Hare established, um, it's just, it's kind of, this was old, old hat. Um, yeah, Van Bethel and Weeblin uh, updated it and introduced the idea of more of a qualitative or quantitative inheritance. Um, but now here we get to the more the part two so cannabinoid expression and inheritance has gotten much more complex as genomic research has developed and what we've found is there's the work of mckernan and vergara um, looking at copy number variants i've mentioned this a couple of times but basically this is different genes that are copied multiple times across the genome and They've been shown in a number of different other species, uh, not talking about cannabinoid genes specifically, but in other species, copy number variants have demonstrated an increase in uh, secondary metabolites. Um, and so that's an area of emphasis. McKernan's looked at it. 
Vergara has done some work there. Uh, Grasa has done some interesting work. There's a very, very interesting findings in that paper that looks at a specific set of QTLs. They also challenge the copy number variant hypothesis. They think that uh, the variation is much more of uh, potency is explained by, um, like I had mentioned earlier, some of those precursor or upstream metabolic pathways. Um, and then the Campbell paper is fucking crazy. Like this is where shit gets really complicated. Um, this paper looks at yeah, I'll just wait until I get there. It's wild. Um, <laughs> so, um, Vergara looks at copy number variants and, like I said, looks at how basically every uh, species has these. Um, it's a fast way of acquiring diversity, rapid adaptation, strong selection pressures, and a key component of genetic variation within species. So we have a very adaptive and plastic species that we're dealing with. Cannabis is incredibly adaptive to all sorts of different environments, and it's developed all sorts of different mechanisms for making it so it's adaptive in these different environments. Copy number variants are probably one of those things. It's not a big surprise that cannabinoids, which it's the only plant that produces them particularly the, at the numbers or the quantities that it produces them, it's probably got some sort of evolutionary adaptive function. Um, and as selective pressure, i.e. either environmental pressures or human selective pressure, these number copy number variants have increased. And there are some studies that indicate that it is a response to human selection. Um, two major cannabinoids, THC, CBD, are products of three-step biochemical pathway. We saw that earlier. Using whole genome shotgun sequence data for 69 varieties, they found genes encoding for synthase in this pathway vary in copy numbers. So that was an early study looking at it. This is really one of like McKernan's work with the Jamaican lion and their uh, genome sequence information and uh, reference genome. Uh, they've really done a lot of work at medicinal genomics and have published a number of really, really cool papers. The findings in this one are one confirm the idea that copy number variants for uh, THC synthase are present in cannabis, that there's quite a few of them, and that this could explain increased potency or increased THC production. Um, but what they also find, which is very interesting, is that there is a link between, there's a genetic linkage between uh, THC copy number variants and uh, so yeah here this identified multiple copy number variants governing governing cannabinoid expression in 82 genes associated with resistance to the fuck I wish wish Matthew was here uh, I have no idea what I wouldn't even know where to begin with that one powdery mildew okay yeah so this aka powdery mildew so results indicate that breeding for plants with low thc concentrations may result in deletion of pathogen resistance genes a refined genetic map of variation in cannabis can guide more stable and directed breeding efforts for desired chemotypes and pathogen resistant cultivars so this is really cool. And the thing that I just skipped over is also cool. So low THC cultivars have a polymorphism every base, um, 50, every 51 bases, while dispensary grade THC cannabis exhibited variant every 73 bases. So what that means, if you have more variation in low THC, i.e. hemp varieties, than you do in high THC dispensary varieties. So there is less variety here 
in the dispensary grade variety, uh, varieties than there is in these low THC varieties. And that's because selection pressure has been more intense here, reducing the number of overall base polymorphisms. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. We, you know, we went away from those low THC cultivars because they didn't do what the consumers wanted. So who needs them? Yeah, and here for this, there's been a lot of intensive breeding and selection. And so the people, the stuff that you get at the dispensary has been put under a pretty intensive selection that's resulted in, you know, fewer polymorphisms than you see in varieties with lower THC. So lower THC is typically a sign of less selection pressure and high THC is a sign of high selection pressure. So these are the things we've been selecting for. These are not. Um, sorry, jump on in. Oh, no, you're fine. I was, uh, yeah, you, you, you said it the way that I meant to say it, but the words did not come out of my mouth. <laughs> uh, no, I actually, after I said it, I was like, fuck, I just repeated what he just said. <laughs> We're all good. Uh, so Grassa et al. had some very interesting findings. This is 2018. I think it's actually 2021, but this was from the preprint. Um, same paper, either way. Um, this is them questioning the idea that copy number variants of THC genes are the are responsible for the variation that's being seen. So what they found or what they say is none of the five separate QTLs that they identified for total cannabinoid po uh, content or potency were associated with cannabinoid synthase genes clusters. For example, the strongest QTL for potency accounting for 17% of variation in cannabinoid content was located on chromosome three rather than chromosome nine. This suggests that traits or genes, uh, gene regulatory elements not linked to cannabinoid synthase gene clusters affect cannabinoid quantity to a greater extent than synthases themselves. Then the next thing, they go on to explain, we might expect gene expressing other metabolic enzymes upstream of THC and CBD in the cannabinoid pathway to be associated with po uh, potency and they identify specific ones. So the hexane pathway, the methyl thritol uh, phosphate path, the MEP, the MEP pathway, <laughs> and uh, the GPP pathway and, uh, or yeah. And um, so all of these, they've, identified specific ones um, and they locate genes in our assemblies and verified their expression. We then compared their physical map position with our genetic map and found two candidate gene proximal to potency QTLs. The gene coding for AAE1, the last enzyme of the hexanate pathway, is located at 39.7 centimorgans. So this is, you know, we talked about centimorgans and linkage maps. So on this chromosome on or at 39.7 centimorgans on chromosome three, there is this gene. And it's associated with 17% of the variance in potency, which is quite a bit, relatively speaking then uh, particular like anytime you're talking about the genetic factor controlling a trait like we saw those heritability um numbers yep. a lot of that is that genetic control for that trait so this right here controls 17 percent of the trait that you're seeing expressed phenotypically which is even though it's doesn't sound like a lot we're not talking about, it couldn't, there's a very low probability that it could ever reach 100 is kind of what I'm trying to say. Um, the gene coding for this badass, 
um, HDR, uh, the last enzyme in the MET pathway, is located at 1.61 centimorgans from a QTL fucker. Um, on the X chromosome that is associated with 9% potency variance. Now, this is dope. So the X chromosome makes this a sex-length trait. The fact that this is present on the X chromosome means that if this were on the Y chromosome, if they had found the this gene on the Y chromosome, then you would have a male sex-linked trait on the Y chromosome that explained 9% of potency variance, which would be a really, really, really good reason to breed with males. But it's on the female, the X chromosome, which is a good reason to breed with females. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking here is does that is that some sort of indicator that potency typically passes on from a female i mean it's a gene that controls nine percent of the potency is connected to the x chromosome it's on the x okay so it's going to be present in a in an XY, like in an XY, it, excuse me, it's not necessarily going to be present. There is always the possibility because of the, the chromosomal system of the X and the Y. So you're always going to have at least one X present, even with males. However, if you're breeding with two females, you're increasing the propensity that you're going to have a gene that codes for potentially 9% of potency variance. So if you're combining two females, huh. you're probably going to increase the probability that you're going to increase potency as opposed to reduce potency because this sex length trait. Now, I can't guarantee, like, this is me guy reading a paper and being like, I'm pretty sure logic allows me to deduce this right i haven't tested this in any way i can't say for certain but mm -hmm. i can say that we have some pretty good like you know anecdotal evidence to support this claim along with the other anecdotal evidence that we have to support the claim regarding light sensitivity and right. genetic expression like i mean i i live i have a fucking really dumb fucking old you know, Takashi 6 9 meme where he's testifying <laughs> and he's saying all your favorite seeds are bad seeds because, like, OG chem cookies, like, they're yeah. the vast majority of the gene pool right now. And mo they came out of bad, like, the origin story is, you know, accidental that's... mistake fucking crosses and bag seeds. They are, and that's interesting because people do like them for their potency. You know, it's nothing hits like the real cam dog. Uh, but again, bag seed presumably was a herm on a female. Female the to female. Wow, that's that's an interesting argument. Again, there's always going to be pluses and minuses, but that's another kind of interesting argument for people going the selfing route, uh, as far as maybe trying to increase potency in a particular line. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Weeblin, Elsoy. So also Weeblin's up in, I believe, Minnesota, um, University of Minnesota. But he works with uh, Muhammad. Um, I'm, fuck, I don't want to butcher dude's first name. Elsol, he, I believe, is his last name. He's the guy that runs the fucking uh, UMIS and has ever since uh, Carlton Turner left to or tucker took off to whatever his name is uh went and became reagan's drugs are <coughs> anyways i digress um they published a paper this paper was looking at um predictable inheritance of chemotype when crossing a feral an uh, industrial hemp and a uh like drug variety and they found they confirmed that there is a QTL that controls the trait. Um, 
that it, there's at least five different chromosomes. It's on at least five different chromosomes, but that was just in reference to the Grassa paper that we just looked at. Um, and that uh, yeah, there was something that I thought had been interesting about this paper, but it's not. It's just another one proving the point. Um, Campbell, this paper fucking is bananas. So, um, unlike previous research, we know non-additive components, so that's epistasis, of cannabinoid inheritance. Concentration of THC is a polygenic trait, three or four genetic factors. Both additive and dominance, uh, I can't remember what CGE, but it's genetic, uh, it's something, yeah, I can't remember what CGE stands for. Um, but it best explains THC expression patterns in contrast. Cytoplasmic genomes and additive genes may influence CBD concentration. Maternal additive effects and additive genetic effects apparently influence CBC expression. Conclusion, cannabis inheritance is more complex than previously associated. Among other genetic effects, cytogenetic and maternal contributions may be undervalued influences on cannabinoid ratios and concentrations. So this is a whole nother level of variability that we're not just dealing with the nuclear genome, you're also dealing with these solely maternal influence here of cytoplasmic genomes and yeah, so that this also adds to the Grassus uh, paper and provides additional explanation for how the influence of additive maternal effects could influence at least CBC expression. But when you go into the paper, they go pretty deep. And I got to say, like, I read this, I think, yesterday. Um, and it was kind of like a, a mind blower in terms of um, adding a whole nother level of complexity to what, I mean, like, I'll be honest, like this part of, I thought I understood um, a lot of this stuff. And like, you know, as cool as this passage right here about, uh, the presence of this gene on the X chromosome was right. like, I was like, okay, yeah, this is within like what I was expecting. I wasn't expecting to also consider, okay, we also have to look at the cytogenetic effects. We have to look at essentially what is the CP, the uh, chloroplast and the uh, mitochondrial DNA and the effect that that's adding and contributing to this trait expression. And, you know, it's, it really is layers on layers on layers of complexity. And when you start like peeling the onion back and really looking at this stuff, it's so incredible that people were able to, like the one people were able to like make food crops and like make them do what they did with those and that like we can eat. But then like with this plant, like the just that graph of like potency in cannabis it's like even how complex this shit is wow and like right. perhaps some of the stuff that we were doing all along that we didn't necessarily you know we didn't have all of the tools to discern what we were doing we were just simply smoking it and saying yeah that works yeah i like that we were doing the things that these people are now elucidating and like they're illuminating what we've done and the work that cannabis breeders have done for generations and are explaining to us shit that we did without necessarily having the scientific ability to characterize and articulate what we were doing yeah we had the almost just had that third sense of doing it and it was you know is rapid uh, or intense farming as well you know sometimes 
it takes a while to develop the new corn variety or the new apple variety or whatnot. Uh, but this was pretty intensive farming. You know, every run you're pulling that, you know, what you perceived as the higher THC or, you know, the better stone, you're pulling that one out and getting rid of the, you know, what may be CBD. And, and I'm curious too, on that last study, I'll have to look at that. I'd be curious if for the, um, maternal contributions may be undervalued in the effects of cannabinoid ratios. Uh, I'm curious if they cited the previous paper to get that uh, information in there or if they came to the conclusion through their own means. Yeah, no, it looked like it was on their own. Um, they made a lot of references to uh, to Dima Hare and to other authors, but it seemed like they were like a lot of this um, the stuff about like non-additive and additive components seem to be really unique to their particular method of analyzing this this issue. <clears throat> and like, there's this paper and the Mudge paper and a couple others that have looked at different omics that I think are some of the things that are really they're changing the way that we understand and they're really like changing the level of analysis. Like they're taking individual like trichomes and using that as the cell that they're then doing the genetic. They're like literally trying to isolate just the transcript information that's going on in the trichome cell and understanding what's going on as the RNA is translating the DNA to make it so that the it produces the proteins and the enzymes that are producing the end results that we know as you know THCA or different terpenes. And the fact that they're getting that level of resolution and like that we have a plant where you really have to do that level of analysis. Like looking at the leaf tissue isn't all that informative if you're really wanting to look at, you know, the specificity of how and what is going on at a genetic level inside the trichome. And if that's really what the fuck you, it's all about, which is so much of the ball game in our plant, not to say that the leaves aren't important, but like you, you got to have that level of discernment and, also, um, some of that terpene analysis, uh, it's, um, I guess the roots have some very unique and specific uh, terpene genes or uh, expression in root uh, cells. So this is this picture is just a another indication or another demonstration of the chromosomes and how they're being the linkage maps are being drawn out on them and again I tried to explain this earlier you've got your autosome your sex chromosomes and yeah and it's a diploid plant so each one of those is got a, a double chromatin. Um, this one shows that right here, sorry, you can jump in anytime, Chad. Uh, yeah, no, you're, you're good. I'm sorry. I just unmuted there for a second, but yeah, we're all, we're all good. Keep going. <laughs> Thanks. Well, yeah, no, I can only, I only know what's going on through the, that sound. Uh, but so this right here, this may, is another representation of kind of what we just saw. Um, here you have a um, the genetic map. There is, where is it in? So basically this zone right here shows that um, genes responsible for Chemotype on chromosome 9 are under selection in marijuana populations and have been the targets for introgression by breeders. So this is, we've been doing heavy selection. And when they do these sort of genetic tests, they can see, okay, 
this area is under intensive selection and it's upregulating for the expression of those genes because breeders are actually trying to select for these. And part of the way they're able to do that is by looking at that, um, those base pairs. So the differential in base pairs is part of the analysis there. And here it's very clear that on this particular chromosome, so chromosome nine, they're able to see a particular segment of the chromosome where uh, particular, where selection has been intensive for cannabinoid synthase. Um, so yeah, we covered cannabinoids, we've covered terps, uh, flowering time, some interesting papers are coming out on that. Uh, Schilling really just says, hey, it's possible to do this. Um, the PAN 2021 paper is very interesting. This talks about uh, Constans-like gene family. Um, this is one of those gene families that's found in a lot of different crop species. It's been characterized in pretty much every other crop species. And because of that, they're able to find similar analogs in cannabis. And this paper does some of that work. Um, and then the name feel at all 2021, we looked at this. This is uh, the paper that did some of the work on uh, specific um, broad sense heritability in cannabis for traits like yield and dry flower yield and uh, height and a number of different traits. Um, like I said, Schilling said this shit's possible Oh, but yeah. And they also explained like how to do it. So it remains to be seen how complex traits will be determined in cannabis, but taking inspiration from the success, successful elucidation of complex traits in maize may motivate the formation of sophisticated multi-parent mapping populations, such as nested associated mapping or multi-parent advanced generation intercross magic populations. So these are different breeding programs or populations that you can create through breeding that will elucidate these traits. And this is how we're going. You would create these populations and then you would track the traits in this instance, flower time over these different populations to be able to infer well, one, to determine on this level, genomically, the, the actual markers associated with the trait, um, absent marker-assisted uh, marker breeding, you could do it through inference using the methods that we talked about earlier. Um, so Pan et al. 2021 did some of this work, and they were able to demonstrate that flowering period of plants is a complex quantitative trait. Um, lots of shit going on, lots of environmental factors that also influence. So there's a lot of variability here between genotypes and environments. Uh, studies have shown that constant like COL is an important regulator of plant response to photo periods and is a core element in the regulation of plant flowering. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't cite the more relevant part to our interest, but I believe they found a specific number of genes that are associated with it and characterize those genes. And now we have the ability to start to build out much like the terpene synthase genes, a whole architecture. And there's really good images. I couldn't really fit any because they were too big on the terps, but, um, there's good images showing the phylogeny and how all of these different genes are not just like associated in cannabis, but like with all other species that also have these same analog genes. Um, so name, feel, this is the, uh, this describes the paper that they did and this is a very interesting paper. It's really worth going into. And, you know, to the extent that you can apply some of these insights, it's something that could actually improve 
One standardization of data collection and utilization of that data collection. So a diverse population of 121 genotypes of high THC and balanced THC CBD ratio was cultivated under a controlled environment and 13 parameters were measured. Um, they found floral bud weight, dry weight was positively associated with plant height and stem diameter but not with days to maturation. So there's a negative correlation there. The heritability of both plant height and days to maturation was relatively high, but plant height decreased during vegetative growth. It, um, and basically you do this shit, it could help improve. Oh, oh yeah. To advance breeding efficiency and prediction equation for forecasting floral blood, bud dry, dry weight was generated given <clears throat> driven by parameters that can be detected during vegetative growth phase only. So essentially they're claiming that they created an equation and a prediction model that just using vegetative growth information can help you predict your yield and different outcomes. Um, yeah. Which and does that, does that get into the chemotype as well? Or is that just, morphological aspects they really primarily look at morphological aspects they're they're basically looking at how to optimize yields so awesome. this, this is like a really good um paper for if that's your jam and you really want to like do data optimization to increase productivity and figure out ways of working on predictive equations that help you select genotypes that are going to be particularly productive. This is the paper you want to read. Like this shit, it slaps. Um, and like I said, we've seen this already. This is the broad sense heritability of different traits and yeah, this is I, this is the only time or the first paper I've seen that actually does that in cannabis. And that's the end of our jam. Um, Damn. Yeah. We're All right. It. Well, yeah, you tell this is this is pretty cool. This is coming up this week. Are you going to be uh, one of the speakers for the I'm virtual not. aquaponics? I'm not, but my homies, like so many homies on this list, great people and uh Oh yeah, Martin Ponix is a, a really great person. He's reached out to me, and I, I hope to be on on the Growing with Fishes podcast here soon. And uh, nice, just you know, it's it's one of those things where I um I appreciate everything he's done, and so many people on this this panel are just I can't like. I cannot encourage people enough to like Reader Steve, who he was mentioned earlier, he yep. is he's brilliant. He is an incredibly nice human being, which is also nice that like, you know, there there are people who reach his level of accomplishment who aren't friendly to random folks and he is one of the nicest people around. That's that's awesome there. He's a funny guy too. I've never met him myself or had a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but I've, I've seen him in a lot of interviews and he, he's a pretty funny guy too. So that's awesome. But yeah, dude, this is, it's an all-star lineup of extremely knowledgeable people. Uh, it's free, which is huge. And, uh, you know, if you thought our four hour, five hour, sometimes six hour shows were long, strap on the diapers for this because <laughs> you're not going anywhere you you can be full for the entire weekend so it's an awesome thing that they've all come together and yeah potent ponix kind of uh being the reg leader there yeah yeah totally so you know shout out dragonfly shout out caleb copyleft cultivars great yes. work is being done here um definitely check out copyleft cultivars they're doing work on ip with genetics and really trying to develop a framework that will help protect sort of a open source culture within the cannabis genetics community so great can't wait to hear what he has to say uh chris trump you know knf 
that's what's up. Uh, heavy days, always great. You know, the podcast, listen to that shit. It's oh, well. Yeah. Wendy, you know, she's K and F and going hard, doing big stuff. It's beautiful to see. Uh, Matthew Gates, he would have known how to pronounce every scientific <laughs> term I had trouble with tonight. And Ooh. it's just brilliant. I agree there. One person I would never want to play Scrabble with, but I'd enjoy a cup of coffee. Dude, it's done. And you know why? It's because he knows all those small words, too. <laughs> yep. Yeah. He's, he's awesome. But yeah, That's and then it. you mentioned Breeder Steve is kicking it off, uh, looks like, Sunday morning. No, bright and early. So that's one, like, if you are still listening to this, like, 8 a.m. fucking PST, get on that shit. It's going to fucking slap. Um, Judge Blooms, homie, he's a good dude. Kevin McKernan, also Dutch Blooms. Like, you know, you catch him on uh, on the, uh, the round tables. Yep, yep. He's uh, next Friday, one week from today, we're going to have uh, Dutch Blooms on here. Uh, we're going to be talking about the regenerative conference. Conference his. That's dope. Yeah, no, he totally spearheaded that and, like, helped get that thing rolling. And honestly, like, you know, incredible, like, much props to everybody involved in that because there's not a whole lot of spaces that still feel like they're in and of the community. And I rolled up to the, to the Mendo one, you know, I think it was 19 now or 20, you know, it was before lockdown and, uh, and we got down and, you know, good people. And it was really good. Good to see everyone there. Um, Mr. Bob Hemphill, all those folks who rolled through to the Mendo, Scene. And Kevin McKernan, he's been cited like dozens of times here tonight because his work with genomics is incredible. Uh, way back, there's a, a YouTube video link. Check out that video. It's fucking, it's really incredible, uh, his work. Um, Clackamas Coop, anybody I haven't mentioned, I mean, no disrespect. I just don't know these people personally, but like, I'm sure they're incredible speakers given who they're speaking with. Um, Clackamas Coot has literally built like the fucking damn near every organic cannabis nutrient line company industry is like riding on that guy's back on so many levels. So, yeah, props to Coot. And, uh, yeah, so I just wanted to give a shout out to my homies and to everybody who's putting this on and making, making it a thing. Jordan River. Fuck yeah, Put moderating on the craft grower panel, that's going to be legit as well. So it's like literally, like I just went through 20, 48 hours or whatever, I can't count, you know, the math yeah. and everything, but you know, bang it. It's gonna be yeah. gonna be insane too, and I see the the for the oh, whoops wrong camera angle, uh, but for the the home growers panel, Scotty Reel, Scotty Reel is one of the uh, the personalities from the Do Grow Show. Uh, oh, right, 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 he's a right. he's a freaking riot. Uh, I've been on their show a couple times and talked with him, and that guy's a riot. So that'll be fun. That'll be interesting to catch too. I know that. Uh, the home grower panel there right before the craft panel. But yeah, that's man. And, and the cool thing and the, and, the, and the huge plus about that is uh, we're going to have, or it's going to be available for replay on YouTube because there really are a lot of people I'd love to catch there, but I don't have that much time in the day. So I know I'm going to catch a lot on the replay. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. You know, so that, that, uh, you know, Check that out, and thank you everyone for listening. If there's any questions or anything, like you know, um, yeah, toss toss them up, uh, toss them up here at the end if you if you guys have any um i know i want to send a you know a big shout out and a big thank you to mr toad mr toad's been in chat um all night he's been holding it down he's been offering great information to everybody so it's like we it's the third panelist on the show this evening so (laughs) shout out to you brother thank you thank you no i I couldn't ask for anybody better to like you know Anything I can cover with the, the interface of chat, like, I know you hold it down. <coughs> yep, he's holding it down. We got Ian down here. So thanks for another epic show, Sun Grown. Definitely putting out some epic information, man. And again, 
I'm glad it's available for replay too, because you know I've got I got I've got my notes. I'm writing along. Woo! We're, there we go. I'm I'm writing along as we go, um, and I, I'm picking stuff up each time. This is awesome, man. I really appreciate it. And I know there's other people out there that are getting the same benefit out of it. And uh, you're you're an ace at what you do as far as being able to get a message across. It's not very easy sometimes when you're dealing with complex subjects but i feel that you 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 put it across in a good way and you give the references of where we can go explore more so i always appreciate that too because yeah. uh you can't you can't cover it all and that's a hard thing as as kind of an educator or a person talking about these things is sometimes you you want to qualify everything that you say but if you do that uh you, you you spin your wheel sometimes, I guess, you know, so it is, yeah, it is yeah. a skill. <laughs> no, totally. It's a, you know, it's one of those things where statistics and footnotes, <laughs> it can be a, a pretty fraught, but I feel like um, all this information is like the slideshow, uh, same thing as last time. I'll put it up in like the folder. Um, all the source material, I'll put all that to you. I mean, it's all in there, but like, it's all over the fucking place. Uh, so like, if you already have the file folder that I've like reference and share with people, like, you don't know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a Google Drive with a lot of information that I use to make all of these presentations. Yes. And it makes it so I can do it quickly, kind of organized, but. Sometimes organization uh, defeats the purpose of organization, and it becomes like I've created too many folders, folders. and now I can't find where. Like, yeah, there's one paper. I'm looking for one paper, and I just fucking cannot find it because it explains the phenomena that we talk about of genetic threat. Of you mentioned like, that earlier, yes. Yeah, I don't know where it is. It's a great paper. I posted it on Instagram once. I can't find it it's gone but like that that paper is a very interesting paper and it talks about that variation in like genetic variation in clone plants um and like also the difference between taking the clone at the top of the plant the middle of the plant okay. or the bottom of the plant and like the amount of uh mutation that somatic mutations that build up yeah wild that, that would be interesting because, you know, a lot of times that conversation of top, middle, bottom for clones is framed around the hormones at them to, to make it root faster. Yeah. Um, that's a mm -hmm. lot of times what the conversation or like the practical application is. But uh, mutations. Interesting. Yeah, I'd love to find that paper. I'd love to have a conversation even just specifically about that because genetic drift, genetic mutation. Um, talked about for as long as i can remember uh it used to be an absolute absolutely happens and then it turned into no it doesn't really happen but if your plant gets sick it's going to remember that and that's how things degrade and this kind of sounds like it's adding a new plot twist to it yeah totally so and that would be interesting the best part of the plot twist is like you know People, people have talked about it for so long, and we've used the term genetic drift, which is not the term. But that was, you know, like, we were, it was just... It. It's the tools we, we had. Having a phenomena, you know? Right. And, like, trying to be like, well, gotta be the genes are changing or some shit. So, I understand why people said it. Uh, people you, sometimes would be shitty and laugh and go, oh, that's not, that's not what that means. But, like, it's, it turns out that the thing that a lot of times people have been poo pooed for mentioning the idea because, in theory, a clone is a clone is a clone is a clone, actually, there is some genetic variance there. And being able to discern that and talk about it and have the right term so that when we go to a scientist and say, hey, blah, 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 is this possible? Right. They may, you know, they may not know and may be like, blah, 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 that doesn't, that's not a thing. But if they're conversant in the subject matter, they'll be like, oh, yeah, we see that phenomenon here, 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 and like, this is kind of what's going on in other crops because typically right. that's their area of expertise. 
and so it's just it, it was really it was one of those things where that paper in particular was like holy shit <laughs> this thing we've been missing for fucking 30 years of talking about this phenomena where there's actually a word for it and i can't fucking right. for the life of me. It, it'll come to you uh hopefully tomorrow afternoon and you'll be like ah all right, April this year. Got to go back. Uh, but yeah, you know, as, as a person who goes clone to clone to clone because I don't have the, the plant count or the room. Um, yeah, totally fascinated. I'd love to love to find that. Love to read it. Love to discuss it. Uh, maybe we could do a study group or something about that one. Definitely. Yeah. That would be awesome. Yeah. Well, cool. You know, I, I really appreciate this and, you know, appreciate everyone for taking it with us. Uh, you know, I... I managed to smoke basically all five. <laughs> Good job. It's a thorough, thorough job. Congratulations, man. And, and again, I, I truly appreciate your time and uh, your effort for putting this together and coming and talking to us and, you know, kind of educating us all, not only tonight, but really throughout the week on Future Cannabis Project and FCPO too. So. May may big buds be bountiful for you, brother. I had to throw another B in there. <laughs> Likewise, yeah, no, good good times. Thank you so much for everything you do. Awesome, man. My pleasure. And and with that, actually, you know, this this whole time I've been flashing. I do have your Instagram, uh, kind of going up. Is that is that the best place to find you, or is there anything else uh, that you'd like to get out there, uh, shout out, or anything like that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I am an IG. I do write. It had been a weekly, but that pace just wasn't. I wasn't producing as well as I like for the Beard Bros on the weekly pace, so I slowed it down. Um, I also write for Skunk Magazine, so shout out to Beard Bros, shout out to Skunk Magazine, um, shout out to, you know, Peter and Gaga. Uh, Daga Gardens now, Daga Dot Garden. Yeah, uh, Daga Dot Gardens. What did you say before that? I thought you said Bieber. Oh, Peter. Oh, Peter. Okay. Peter. God, I thought you said Bieber. I'm like, where's he going with his shout outs, man? <laughs> Britney Spears, she's free today. Shout out. <laughs> Shouts to my peeps. But no, um, uh, Peter with uh, Daga Dot Gardens. And thank yes. you for for everything you're doing there, man. And yeah, check out like, check out all the seeds and all the products on there. Uh, the genetics like uh, J2 can uh, is on there. Like, I don't know if y'all know him, but if you don't like check his gear out, uh, lots of very cool old school genetics coming from him. Um, he's been on some recent podcasts. If you can listen to him talk, it's fucking definitely worth it and uh i think it's bird seed preservation is the, the seed company but he goes by j2 pan on uh on the gram but uh yeah and, and uh jimmy myers uh he he's worked with the same 88g13 hack plan as me we've done a lot of we share a lot of genetics he's somebody who just i mean if he ever had time to get on and do an IPM podcast or episode like be a gig yeah like him and Matthew Gates are like uh, yeah all star team there but yeah so just there's so many cool people that are involved in all this you know code holding it down like everything all y'all doing big shit and I appreciate you and it's really good to see everybody like you know, just all the all the breeders on there, and also all the different like, you know, people populating the space and bring home growing networks and different people together so that you know we're we're figuring out ways to do sort of collaboratively the shit that we talked about in this this uh, during the presentation. Yeah, it's a, it's a good community. It's a good collaborative effort too, and you know it, it doesn't really matter age, but you know it's it's like you're able to teach people that are new coming into the space, whether they're 45 or 25, but teaching them this information and kind of some of the you know the ways, uh, it, it hopefully is going to lead to a better future 
for the community that we want to see. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta lay out a map. Yeah. So. Yeah. And also, you know, shout out to everybody who did it before, you know, like all the people who have, because some of this is reiterative. Like the, mm -hmm. We're going through another process where there was like folks like old timer, folks like, you know, cheap six turtles or there was a yeah no if you go back into old sensi tips and like old books like the earlier magazines a lot of the bleeding information was coming from him like there were cats that were like that have laid all this foundation out before and you know every five ten twenty years it's like we have to go through that cycle again because there's new people who haven't necessarily who weren't there who didn't hear it from those folks but like you know so it's just i appreciate everyone who's been part of that process and i've learned so much from all of the different people who've already like sort of trodden this path that it's definitely helps for them yep yep the the ogs you know the the frenchy cannolis of the world who left this space a better place even after they're gone so yeah. shout out to the knowledge r.i.p frenchy and um i guess that's that'll wrap it up for this evening um i am uh, chad.westport on instagram you can find me chadwestport.com and you can find me all over here on future cannabis project fcp02 deuces part do part do is done <laughs> so i appreciate it man we'll we'll, we'll say peace out the deuce out <laughs>